Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2017 NCBA League meeting. My name is Sandy Sanderson. I'm president of the NCBA. And uh, before we get started, I just want to, you know, address the, the audience a little bit, uh, talk about our past and our future. Uh, 2017 was uh, a phenomenal year for us. Uh, if you think about where this league came from over the last 17 years, starting with just 34 teams, uh, 2017 brought about uh, us crossing the 300 team mark, a monumental goal that you know wasn't even imaginable, imaginable when this uh, league got started. Uh, looking back and how the season progressed, uh, we had uh, Slippery Rock University win the D2 national title with phenomenal pitching performances in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and then East Carolina and UCF going to battle in uh, Holly Springs, North Carolina with ECU winning the Division I national title, one nothing in 10 innings in, in what's arguably the, the greatest NCBA World Series game we've ever had uh, the privilege of experiencing. Um, we later, you know, weeks later, we got to see our, our MVP from the World Series uh, move on and, and uh, cut his teeth in the professional ranks of Major League Baseball, and we wish him the best as uh, his career moves forward. Um, 2017 was absolutely a phenomenal year for the NCBA, and th that, uh, that looks even brighter looking to 2018 as we, we, we uh, bridge a new uh, adventure in uh, this league's history as we launch NCBA Division III. Uh, a new uh, branch of the NCBA, a new branch of club baseball uh, designed to make the experience better for all involved. Uh, Division II teams will have the opportunity to uh, uh, compete against uh, their peers, uh, to have more opportunities to make the postseason. Division III teams will have a, a new platform by which to get their feet wet, build their programs, and, and hopefully strive to get into Division II in the future um, while giving an experience where, where they can be competitive on the field against uh, teams of, of equal caliber. Uh, as we get ready to begin this meeting, I'd like to present and introduce uh, VP of Baseball Operations, Christian, Christian Smith, who will take it from here. Thank you, Sandy. <coughs> and uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to be with you the majority of this meeting. We'll also introduce a lot of uh, familiar faces uh, throughout the meeting, but get used to me because I'll be up here for the, uh, like I said, the majority of the meeting. This meeting is interactive. We encourage you to, uh, in the video, in the comments section underneath the video, to ask questions, and the narrator will read those questions aloud, and the presenter will do their best to answer those questions. Um, let's get started. If you want to download the meeting slides, you can get those uh, from the headline section section of the NCBA website. That's clubbaseball.org. If you scroll down to the bottom of the website headline section you'll see those slides right there you can download those and follow along um, and again just to reiterate this is interactive uh, we want this to be in as, as informative to all teams as possible um, so if you want to ask a question just type into the comments section below the video feed your name your team affiliation the question and uh, we'll like I said try to answer that question to uh, the best of our ability uh, the headquarters of the NCBA here in Pittsburgh, 850 Ridge Avenue. Um, our phone number you see there if you ca in case you need to get a hold of us in the website clubbaseball.org. Uh, the agenda for tonight's meeting, we're going to meet the NCBA staff, uh, some of the full-time staff, as well as the volunteer regional directors and district coordinators uh, that are very valuable to us. Uh, we'll also talk about the 2016-17 season as a year in review. We'll also look to this upcoming season, 2017, 2018, and what's to come there. Uh, after that, we'll get into some breakout sessions, talk about some team operations, uh, some sponsors and fundraising, and then uh, some, some uh, events, spring training events and our World Series event. So as far as the NCBA front office goes, these are uh, the, the people that run the league from a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you just met our president, Sandy Sanderson. Uh, myself, Vice President of Baseball Operations. Um, you'll also be introduced to Eric Curator later in this meeting. He's the Director of Division II Baseball Operations. And right now he's the interim uh, Wilson DeMarini Louisville Slugger uh, Sponsor Account Manager. Um, you'll also be introduced to Alex Kane, who was recently named the Director of Division III Baseball Operations. And we'll be talking about Division III uh, in more depth later in the meeting, um, but we're really excited to have Alex on board running the Division Three League. Our treasurer is Sandy Sanderson Sr. Uh, our accounting specialist is Jeannie Kerchala. If you're getting any invoices, um, they're usually coming from her. 
Um, our sports information director is Rachel Weber, and she'll be up here uh, towards the very end of this meeting to kind of let you know uh, what she does on a daily basis for the NCBA. The Rawlings sponsor account manager is Paul Williams. That's a new position uh, for Paul this year. He's his first year with us. Uh, he's taken over for Craig Budzik as the Rawlings sponsor account manager. He's doing great things with the Rawlings account. The game uh, headwear, uh, Felicia Battaglia. Uh, she'll be in later uh, to talk about the game and all the exciting new uh, hats that uh, teams will have the opportunity to wear and purchase. Um, we have the director of spring training operations, Tracy Reardon. Uh, who's taking the spot of longtime uh, vice president of spring training operations, uh, Savannah, Savannah Aarons. Tracy will be up here uh, to give some great news about the past event in Tampa and then moving forward into 2018, so stay tuned for that. And then you have our rules committee teams reps. You have Matt Reidner and Chad Lowe. Um, Matt's position as the Division I rules committee team rep is up for re-election this year. So if that's something that you're interested in, you know, getting involved with the rules committee, uh, be sure to look out for that in the fall, because uh, that's a great way to uh, be involved with the rules committee is to run for that uh, team rep pre uh, position. And last but not least, our director of um umpires is Ryan Hastings. Um, if you've ever been to a World Series event, Ryan is a fixture down there. He's uh, been with us for a very long time, very knowledgeable and a great umpire. Um, so if you have any questions about um, Umpires, Ryan's a great asset, so please reach out to him. Uh, now, as far as our Division I regional directors go, um, you'll see myself running the North Atlantic. Rachel Weber, who did a great job her first year in the Mid-Atlantic last year, uh, will be the Mid-Atlantic regional director, obviously, moving forward. The South Atlantic is now run by Tracy Reardon, who we're really, really excited about. She's taking the spot of Eric Curator, uh, who ran that region for, for several years. Uh, Tracy just took that position a few weeks ago. Uh, we're really excited for, uh, for her to be on board the, as a Division I Regional Director. The Great Lakes is another new position we fill with Alex Kane. Uh, he was running uh, Division II District last year, um, but we moved him up to the Great Lakes. He's a former uh, Bowling Green player, um, so he's very knowledgeable of the Great Lakes, and we're really excited to have him on board as well. The Gulf Coast, permanent fixture there, Mr. Ryan Norris running that, doing great things down there. Uh, the Mid-America, you see my name there. Uh, I guess you could call me the interim Mid-America Regional Director. We are looking for volunteers for that position right now. So if that is something that you want to uh, pursue, please reach out to me. It's a great way to stay involved. It's a great resume, resume, resume builder um, if that's what you're looking for. So if that's something that you want to stay involved with the NCBA, maybe you graduated uh, and are looking to just stay involved, um, this is a great opportunity. It's a lot of fun. Um, so if that's something that interests you, please reach out to me. The Northern Pacific region is run by Norm Doyle. Norm's been out there for several years, was the head coach of uh, Utah State, two-time national champion. Um, so he's been running the Northern Pacific for several years now, and uh, we're excited to have him out there and uh, continue to be out there. The Southern Pacific region is Michael Olivo. He's also been somebody with uh, the as a volunteer with us for a while now and has been uh, great for us out in the SOPAC region. Now, as far as the D2 staff goes, is these are the district coordinators. Um, you'll see those guys listed there. Eric's running both uh, Districts 1 and District 2. You have Ben Knott, who's a former uh, player at Furman University, running District 3. Uh, Stephen Baker, who's a former NC State club baseball player, uh, running District 4. Jeff Bober, who's a former Illinois player uh, in District 5. Gary Robinson, I believe played for Wright State uh, club baseball in District 6. Uh, District 7 is Paul Williams. He just got announced not too long ago, maybe yesterday or today, um, as the District 7 uh, District Coordinator, which we're really excited to have him on board uh, running that district. And then last but not least, in District 8, we have Austin Menely, um running District 8. He's been doing great things with that. We will talk about later, um, you see Districts 1 through 8. Uh, if you've been following on Facebook, Eric's posted uh, asking for recommendations. We're going to get those renamed for you. Uh, in Division Two, so they're going to have actual region names, um, and I know uh, Eric's getting a lot of cool uh, ideas, so stay tuned for that, but uh, they will no longer be districts. They will actually have uh, region names, which uh, we're excited about. Again, if you're just joining us, um, please download the meeting slides, clubbaseball.org. Um, they're right in the headlines. You can download them and follow along.
Now, what we're going to get into is this past year, uh, a year in review. We're going to talk about the growth of the league that we experienced. Um, we're also going to talk about the rule changes that were implemented this past year. We'll also talk about the new rules that are being implemented for uh, the 17-18 season, but we'll also be uh, reviewing the rules we put into place uh, for 16-17 and 16, 17 season. And then we'll get into the realignment that we, uh, we pushed through for 16-17 uh, as well. Um, as you can see, here's a, a nice chart showing our growth from the first year all the way up to 2017, and it's a nice pattern. It's, it's growing every single year. Uh, this past year, we added about 20, looks like 21 teams um, net. Uh, we, I think, added 33 teams, um, obviously lost a few, um, but netted about 21 teams. So we're really excited about that. We're going to continue that growth pattern for 2018. Our goal is to be around that 330 mark. Um, so we're really excited, and you should be too, about the, uh, the just the growth the NCBA has, has gone through since its inception. Here's a little uh, a graph showing our state representation, which is another thing that's really exciting. You see we're in 44 states. The year prior, we were in 43. We just, uh, this past year, we added the University of Rhode Island, uh, making it our 44th state that we're in. Rhode Island had such a successful year that uh, they actually started the Division Three team in our league. Um, next year, this time uh, next year, and during this meeting, we'll be hope we'll be showing at least 45 because we will be going uh, into the University of New Hampshire, which is another state, um, which means that we only have five states that we're not in, two of which are Alaska and, and uh, Hawaii. Um, so that's really exciting. I really feel in the next few years, uh, maybe in a year or two, um, that we'll, all, we'll have state representation in, in the lower 48. Um, we also have uh, Canada. We have the University of Windsor, who's a very successful program the past two years um, in Division Two. But they, uh, being so successful, they actually moved up to Division One. So exciting things there as well. And this is just giving you guys an idea of where we sit as far as uh, other uh, college baseball leagues. Um, you see we're sitting right kind of in the middle uh, between NC NJCAA D1 and NJCAA D2. Again, uh, we expect uh, to be around that 330 mark uh, for 2017-18. Um, so that'll give you a kind of idea of where we sit next to other uh, college baseball leagues. Now I want to get into, again, these are some of the rules that we put into place this past year. These are not the rules, the new rules that we had at the Rules Committee meeting this past year, or excuse me, this past month that we're putting into uh, the rule book this year. These are rules that you already played with. Um, so I want to, I don't want to go through all, every single one of these, but I do want to touch on a few of these um, on each slide, some of the major ones. Um, one of which, number four, uh, we reduce the, the maximum roster size from 33 to 30. Um, and the reason we, we the rules committee did that, um, I, I believe is the idea behind it was to try and level the playing field slightly. Um, there are some universities that might not have the opportunity uh, to get 33 guys on the roster. Uh, so we wanted to just close that gap just a little bit to try and even the playing field as, as best as possible. Um, so the reason we did that was, was to make that a uh, little more fair for all teams involved. Um, with that being said, we did provide a little more flexibility. In point number five, we allowed five players to be removed from the roster uh, if they met documented reasons. Um, in previous years, I believe that number was three. Uh, we moved that up to five just to give them more flexibility since we did um, make the roster size three uh, individuals smaller. Um, I did want to talk about uh, number eight, adding a rule to 4.02.2.2, stating that a single makeup game um, could be played as a seven inning game if approved by the regional director. Um, in the NCBA D1, all single games need to be nine innings, um, but we added an exception to that rule, basically saying that the reason behind it is a lot of teams get, you know, makeup games way back towards the end of the season where they need to get a l need to get games in. Um, and for a certain weekend, they may have two opponents they need to play, maybe a series against one team and then just a, a single makeup game against another team. Um, we wanted to make that single game against that team B, so to speak, possible to be played as a seven-inning game. 
Um, rule number nine, adding the clarification that a triple header can be played as seven inning games. We've, we've got that question a lot. Um, it's always been that if you played a triple header, it could be played as seven innings, but we just wanted to get that into the rule book so that it was clear that teams could see. Um, number Point number 12 in this, adding a clarifi clarification example uh, to rule 5.02.2 regarding mound visits. Again, this isn't really a rule, it's just a clarification, um, and the, the meaning behind it is a lot of teams, their designated manager might be their catcher, and every time that catcher would go out to talk with the pitcher, it was going to be counted as a mound visit. Not a lot of teams understood that, so we wanted to put that into the rule book so that teams understood you know, it's probably not best to put your catcher as the designated manager if he's the you know, officer or president of the team probably best to put somebody else as that designated manager just so that every time the catcher goes out to talk to the pitcher it's not charged for a mound visit. I want to talk about point number 13 which is adding uh, failure to report subs before the next pitch um, will result in an auto, auto ejection of the coach. Um, that is basically you have to let the head umpire in chief know before a sub goes in that, they, uh, that you're putting in a sub. If you fail to do that and a pitch is thrown, the head coach is automatically ejected. Um, that, that. Roster violations. Um, protests must be made before first pitch or as soon as a sub not listed on the lineup card enters the game. Uh, this was probably our, our the biggest hot topic at the rules committee meeting. Um, this was basically, we had a lot of teams, uh, A, were playing ineligible players not on the roster but we also had uh, teams waiting till the end of the game after they may have lost to protest that game um, what we wanted to just clean up was at ground rules you need to protest the game if they get your uh, if you get your opponent's lineup card and it doesn't have a player on the roster at that point is when you have to protest not later in the game um, so we clean that up as well um, and we also added a section to that if to kind of penalize the team that did play the ineligible player if if it was protested correctly or incorrectly that team was going to lose one hundred dollars of their performance bond um, another big rule uh, point number 18 if umpires are 30 minutes or more late to a scheduled game time it becomes an automatic forfeit unless teams mutually agree to play later than the scheduled start. Um, you know, sometimes it's out of the umpire's control that they can't get there on time. Uh, if they are 30 minutes or more late, that qualifies for an automatic forfeit. But we're here to play baseball. Teams are here to play baseball. And if teams both agree, hey, it's only going to be about a 15-minute delay that we can pick that game up, we won't, we won't, uh, it won't cause an automatic forfeit. Um, we wanted to update the rules to the game. The game headwear is our new headwear sponsor. We wanted to make sure that teams know that you have to wear the game headwear in games, especially this year. Um, we grandfathered Richardson cap in last year, um, but this year it's exclusively the game headwear. Um, so you need to wear ga the game headwear uh, for all your games or you'll be out of uh, uniform. So we wanted to make sure we got the game into the rule book as well. Um, adding all or part of their in quotations to rule 4.06.3 that's in regards to the mercy rule um, if the home team is up and they only need up by 10 runs and they only need part of their inning to get to 10 runs they don't need to complete that inning the game can be stopped as soon as they reach uh, that 10 run uh, threshold um, stats for the entire team must be uploaded for the nominations of player and pitcher of the week to be considered um, this is just an encouragement to get teams to put their stats up um, and we reward those teams that do put their stats up with player and pitcher of the week honors um, so again that's something we put into place that if you want to uh, your nominations for player or pitcher of the week to even be considered uh, you have to have your stats up uh, we also allowed the mid uh, mid america north and the mid-atlantic west to play fall games uh, those are areas of the country the mid uh, mid american north is up in minnesota and iowa um, and the mid atlantic west is in ohio uh, and down into kentucky um, it was really tough getting spring all the spring 
getting all the games in just in the spring. So we allowed those conferences uh, to play fall ball, um, which they are currently doing now, which is great, and it's freeing up the spring for a lot of these teams. Um, and then for the 2017-18 season, adding a performance bond for the Division II teams. Um, that, is in in that is in place, and teams are uh, currently paying those, and that is mainly due to the fact that we now have Division III, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, but we did move some of the, the underperforming Division II teams down to Division III, um, which made Division II a very tough, legitimate, competitive league, uh, and we expect things from that, from those teams in Division II, and the performance bond was just added in there, so uh, that teams don't forfeit. Uh, it's a, a, a deterrent from teams forfeiting uh, that is in place, and we're really excited about that, and will hopefully deter teams from forfeiting games at the D2 level. Um, want to talk about realignment. Again, just want to make sure if you're just joining us, this is realignment that we put into place in the 2016-2017 season. Um, this is Division One. We moved automatic call-up St. Louis uh, to the Uni St. Louis University to uh, the Mid, -Ameri Mid America South Conference. They were a great fit there. Um, we only had five teams in that conference before, and they were a great fit uh, to become that sixth team. Uh, we moved the University of Montana from the NOPAC North uh, to the NOPAC South, and moved the University of Washington from the NOPAC West to the NOPAC North, and added new team Portland State to the NOPAC West. Um, we moved Georgia from the South Atlantic West to the South Atlantic East and added automatic call-up University of Tennessee Chattanooga to the South Atlantic West. And then last but not least, we moved Humboldt State uh, University out of the SOPAC North. Uh, we moved them down to Division II, and we moved Stanford from the West to the North um, and Grand Canyon and automatic call-up uh, University of San Diego uh, to the SOPAC South. And then lastly, moved Cal State Fullerton and Cal State Long Beach from the south to the west. So that was uh, this previous year. Um, one of the things that we're really shooting for at the Division I level is to have three conferences of six teams. What that three conferences does, it does allow for an at-large bid. Uh, we had an at-large bid in all eight regions, which is great. And the six teams in each conference is a, is a, is a nice number. Five, we feel, is uh, a little too small with only four conference series. Uh, six is five conference series, um, and it's still, we, we feel that we're able to get it in. So with these moves, we were able to have, uh, I believe, six of the eight regions having three conferences, all of six teams, which is, is great. Now, as far as the Division II realignment went, um, like we touched on before, St. Louis University, San Diego, and UT Chattanooga all met that automatic promotion role to the Division I level. We had room for them at the D1 level, so they were all called up. Um, we had districts three, four, six, and seven all move to four conferences, which in that case eliminated the at-large bid. So um, it's, it's, it stinks for the teams that finish in second place that they don't have a shot to make playoffs. But what we're really excited about is in Division Three, with Division Three opening up, which we will talk about later, that we were able to pull a lot of those teams out of Division Two down to Division Three. And we'll talk, we'll talk about the Division II realignment uh, shortly, um, but we were, were really excited about it. We're able to get all of Division II back down to three conferences. So all eight districts, regions, whatever you want to call it, in Division II will now have that at-large bid, which is always exciting. The second-place finishers will have a shot to make the playoffs. So that was we had to move to four conferences just because of the oversaturation of the amount of teams uh, in our league. Um, and which was, a re you know, we were required basically to open up a Division Three league uh, just because of the amount of teams we had were so many. So we're really excited about that moving forward for the 17-18 season. Um, and, yeah, just to, to kind of reiterate, conferences with uh, Districts 1, 2, 3, and uh, 4 um, were all realigned given the growth on the East Coast. Um, District 6 added five new teams, providing four conferences of six teams. And then District 7, we added a sec second conference within Texas. Again, if you're just, or, uh, just joining us, um, we want to make this interactive. We haven't had a question yet. Uh, you guys are letting me off the hook pretty easy. 
Um, so if you want to ask a question, if you have any questions about what I just talked about, um, please type your name, team affiliation, and question into the comments section uh, just below the video feed. We have a narrator sitting there right now, Mr. Alex Kane. He's ready to read your questions. Um, and I will do my best, or whoever the presenter is will do their best to answer that question. So please ask away. Now we want to get into 2018 and what's to come. Um, we're really excited, as Sandy mentioned in uh, the introduction, we're really, really excited. We had a great 2016-17 season, and we're even more excited for the 2017-18 season. Got a lot of new teams that we'll be talking about. Um, we have D1, D2, and D3 alignment, and it shouldn't, it probably should have deleted the word possible because we did have our realignment meetings and we're pretty locked up uh, as far as realignment goes and it's pretty much done. Um, we'll be talking about Division Three, which we're really, really excited about and you should too. And then uh, we'll also have Sandy come back up and talk uh, about the Rules Committee and the new rule changes that were put into place for this upcoming season. So that'll be an important um, section of the presentation to, uh, to, to listen to because that will, uh, that section will talk about uh, the new rules being put in place. Now as far as new teams go, we have 17, actually it should be 18, um, new teams officially signed uh, for the 2017-18 season. Um, like we talked about earlier, the University of New Hampshire, that puts us into another state. We're really excited to have them on board. Uh, I also touched on Rhode Island. They had such a successful first year in our organization that they're having a Division II team and a Division III team. Um, Mississippi State, another big name school uh, that we're really, really, we've been trying to get in uh, the league for a very long time. Alex did a great job getting them on board. Uh, so we're really, really excited about that. Um, so seven, excuse me, 18, because Seton Hall actually just a few hours ago uh, officially uh, signed with us. So this new team that uh, has verbally committed Seton Hall University is actually a, uh, an official NCBA team. Um, so we're really excited to have them on board as well. Um, there's also 18 uh, teams that have expressed interest. And what that means is they're, they're talking with Alex Kane, the director of team development, about how, how to join the league, budgeting, what they basically need to do to become a, an officially recognized club sport um, and are really interested uh, in joining the league. Um, out of these 18 teams, I don't know what the percentage is, but not all of these teams will join for this upcoming season. Um, but we hope that uh, the majority will. And there's always teams that uh, come, you know, out what we say out of the woodwork uh, later in the season that want to get on board. So we have 18 already in the league. I think we're well ahead of our pace that we were last year. 18 teams expressed interest. So we're really, really excited about the growth. Uh, and our goal is to get around that 330 team mark uh, for the 2017 2018 season. Now, this is. The exciting stuff, D1 realignment. Um, this is what the conferences look like for this 2017-18 season. Um, Division one, I, the, the website is completely up to date. I don't believe, um, I don't know if the Division two website's up to date with the realignment, but if you have any questions about you know, your conference, if anything changed, you can go to the website and check that out. But here's the things that uh, we did as far as D1 goes this year. Um, Ferris State University was a Great Lakes uh, North team. We moved them down to Division II, uh, which opened up a spot, obviously, in the Great Lakes North. And the University of Windsor, who's been an extremely successful program at the Division II level, has taken their place uh, in the Great Lakes North. So we're really, really excited about the University of Windsor um, in Division I. They are very excited about it, so it's just a win-win for everybody. Uh, a lot of moves happened in the North Atlantic region, which uh, is the region that I specifically oversee, and I'm really excited about it. Um, we moved Boston University out of the uh, North Atlantic North, um, which opened up a spot, obviously. Sacred Heart moved into their spot. They've always been um, trying. They used to be in the North Atlantic North. We moved them um, to the east. They've always been trying to get back to the north, um, so we were able to grant them that request and get them back into the north. Uh, with a vacancy of uh, Boston University moving down or moving uh, out of uh, the North Atlantic North. Um, Loyola University, Maryland uh, is a team that took Sacred Heart's spot in the uh, North Atlantic East. They've always been a team chomping at the bit to get into Division One. 
We had never had the room for them. Um, things opened up. We asked them if they wanted to move up to Division One. They weren't an automatic call-up, um, but they are a team that uh, is very successful at the D2 level, and they just jumped at the opportunity and now in Division One, and we're really, really excited about them. And then, last but not least, we moved SUNY Cortland um, down to Division Two, which obviously opened up a spot in the North Atlantic West. And the Division Two national champion, Slippery Rock University, are now in the North Atlantic West, which we're thrilled about having them. Um, a very good program, uh, local program here uh, close to Pittsburgh. Um, so we're really proud of uh, their accomplishments and really excited to see how they do at the Division One level competing with uh, the guys in the, the North Atlantic West. Um, this is a possibility. This is one of the things that are still up in the air. Latter-day Latter -day Saints Business College, um, moving them right into Division One into the Northern Pacific South Conference. They're a uh, team located in the uh, in Salt Lake City, um, so it's just a matter of if we have room for them. Uh, we're still waiting on a few LPAs from teams out in the NOPAC, um, so that's going to uh, depend on if we can get Latter-day Saints Business College into the NCBA this first year. Um, we did remove uh, Florida International University out of the South Atlantic South Conference, uh, and we're also able to replace them with Florida Gulf Coast, who uh, is an automatic call-up team. Um, they've been very successful at the Division II uh, level, made uh, the Division II World Series this past year, had a great run there. Um, so we're really excited to see what they do uh, in the South Atlantic South. And then last but not least, we moved Stanford University out of the uh, SOPAC North and down to Division II. And Chico State, who's a uh, fairly new program, um, they are taking Stanford's spot. We're really excited about Chico State. They're very much like Loyola, Maryland, always chomping at the bit to get into the Division I uh, league. And uh, we asked them to, uh, if they wanted to jump up to D D1, and just like Loyola, Maryland, they uh, jumped at that opportunity. So really excited about uh, having them there as well. Division II realignment. Um, I don't know, Eric, is the website up to date? Is not up to date yet. It will be shortly. Um, but internally, we have the breakdown of the realignment, how everything works, and I touched on it earlier, that we are excited that all eight districts are going to be three conferences. So all eight districts are gonna have that opportunity at an at-large bid, uh, which is really, really exciting. It's something that we shoot for. Um, all these conferences, they're ranging from four to six teams each. Um, with Division Three opening up, we were able to take fifth 15 to 20 previous D2 teams and move them down to Division 3. And again, what that did, we were oversaturated with teams at the D2 level. Now we were able to take some D2 teams and move them down to Division 3, and that opened up space. Um, it made D2 much more competitive, uh, and we're really excited about that. We're also excited about uh, you know having these teams down in D, uh, Division 3 to get uh, their organization under control and, and be competitive and hopefully move back up to uh, Division II uh, or Division I in the near future. And as we also touched on earlier, you know, all the districts that were, you know, District 1, 2, 3, and so on, those are now going to become specific region names. Um, if you have any cool ones, I know Eric is, uh, is looking for some cool names on the Facebook group page. Um, so be sure to uh, give him some ideas because it could be uh, we can have a lot of fun with it. So look out for those uh, coming out hopefully uh, mid September. Dun dun dun! Division three. That was a terrible drum roll. Division three. We're excited. We're launching Division three for the 2017-2018 season. Oh, we have our first question. Just got nervous. <laughs> Reed Star, uh, Loyola, Maryland. Oh, Loyola, Maryland. Okay. Uh, does I know. D1 have at-large bids for playoffs? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. All Division One, um, all eight regions. There are three conferences. Uh, regional tournaments are four teams, so each each conference winner gets an automatic bid. But we'll be looking at all the second-place teams that finish uh, in all Division One region conferences. Um, and picking the best at large bid uh, that we feel is, is is deserving of it. So, yes, Reed, you will have in in the North Atlantic there will be an at large uh, selection. But very good question. Um, back to um, Division Three, 
we're really, really, really excited about it. We were hoping to launch it last year, um, just weren't able to do it. We are launching it, obviously, this year. Um, we just named Alex Kane the director of Division Three operations, I think, uh, a month or so ago. We're really excited to see what he's able to do um, with the Division Three league, so he's going to do a great job out there. Um, we are, we do have the Division Three rule book. Uh, it's not online yet. We will be releasing that in conjunction with the Division One and Division Two rule books, which we hope to have uh, out uh, within the next week or so. Now they're flooding in. Another question. Jake Brogdon, Wofford College. Will D3 have district playoffs, and if so, will they be similar to Division Two? Yeah, it's a, that's a very good question. Um, we hope so. We, we definitely hope so. Um, we'll be talking uh, in a, a, maybe a slide um, about Division Three realignment. Um, we're still in the beginning stages. We're still collecting LPAs, but we are hopeful that we'll be able to split. There's going to be four districts um, in Division Three, and we're hopeful, we're hopeful that we're able to get enough teams down there that we're going to be able to split each district into two conferences, uh, which will be a uh, – the top two conference winners will play, I believe, in a best of three. That's that's what we're hoping for. Um, that's not final, but there will be playoffs uh, for the Division Three teams, and the winners of those, if you want to call them regional tournaments, um, will move on to a uh, the World Series, which we'll discuss later. But um, very good question. Um, where do we leave off? Um, new teams from the 2017-18 season um, will be uh, put in Division Three, so. Um, unless, like Mississippi State's a team that, that, that we don't really have room for in the Division Three league, or not room for, but they're just not close to any other teams. Um, they may be a team that, that moves right into Division I. Um, but the majority of brand new teams that join the NCBA will be automatically put into Division Three, no matter the size of the school. Um, they will automatically put into Division Three, um, And I think we kind of just touched on this a little bit, but Division Three will have four districts with some district with some of the districts having district playoffs, hopefully all of them. Um, the Division Three World Series will feature uh, four teams that will compete in a, in a double elimination uh, tournament. And what we're hopeful with this Division Three league is it's only going to strengthen uh, the Division Two and the Division uh, Division One league. So um, as the Division Three continues to expand, again, we, we are in our inf infancy stages. This is our first year. Um, but as we continue to grow, um, it's only going to make the league overall better and a better experience for the teams. So we're really, really excited about it. Now, as far as the Division Three staff, you see a lot of Alex Kane on that slide. Um, Alex is currently looking for uh, volunteers to run these districts. And as I talked about, uh, we're looking for a mid or excuse me, a Mid America Regional Director in Division One. We are looking for district coordinators to run districts one through four at the division three level so if that is something that you're interested in i know alex has a couple candidates already he's speaking with um, but if that is something that you're interested in something that you want to stay involved with the ncba you want to put something on your resume this is a perfect way to do it perfect way to stay involved with club baseball um, so if that is something that you're interested in please reach out to alex um, and we would love to have uh, have you as a volunteer district coordinator uh, in the Division Three League. Now here we go, the Division Three uh, district realignment. Um, we're pretty solid at D1 and D2 as far as realignment goes, knowing exactly what's happening. Um, the Division Three League, we're having, uh, still in the infancy stages of that. We have a question. Nolan Rodman, University of Toledo. Can current players serve as district coordinators? Um, we're open to it. Um, we've had, um, we've had, we've done that in the past, and there's, if you want to call it a conflict of interest, uh, in some cases, um, that it just it wasn't uh, a, a great seamless process, or uh, it wasn't seamless for the the regional director and the teams. Um, again, there was sometimes conflict of interest. So it's something if you're interested in it, please reach out to Alex or myself. Uh, we definitely love to consider it and look into it. Um, but it's hard to give an answer on that. Um, now, as far as div uh, Division Three district realignment, again, we're in the infancy stages. Um, these, all these teams listed are teams that have LPAs in. Um, they are definitely going to be in these districts. 
Um, but we have a lot more other teams that we're still waiting on their LPAs that are going to be going into these districts. So like District 1 has uh, one, two, three, five teams. Uh, it's going to be many more than just five teams. And we're hopeful that we're going to be able to split the District 1 into a north and south division, which will give a uh, regional or district playoff for those teams and the winner moving on to the World Series. Um, division, or excuse me, District 2, uh, District 3, and District 4, same thing. Um, we have many more teams hopefully going into those, uh, those districts, uh, hopefully being able to split those into uh, two divisions. Um, but some nice names on there, some, some teams like the University of Richmond that used to be a member of our university that uh, now came back. I'm really excited to have them back on board. You see the University of Toledo, we just heard from uh, Nolan. Um, you know, they had such a successful uh, season that they have a Division Two and Division Three team now. So really excited about Division Three. The realignment uh, meeting was a lot of fun. Um, so all in all, we're just thrilled with this league, and I hope the everybody that's watching is, ex is excited for Division Three um, because it's going to do great things for the overall NCBA and uh, for your experience in the league. Now I'm going to uh, take a little bit of a break and I'm going to reintroduce uh, the president of the NCBA, Commissioner Sandy Sanderson. He's going to talk about the NCBA Rules Committee that we just had this, uh, this past July and the new rules that he's going to touch on a few rules, uh, important rules that we put into place for this upcoming 17-18 uh, season. So Sandy? Thank you, Christian, and I, I happen to be following on Facebook, seeing some of the uh, proposed um, uh, new names for the D2 districts, and uh, there's some good ones out there. I'm, i got to admit, I'm a big fan of the Chesapeake region. So, uh, anyway, I think that's pretty solid. So, good work. People keep coming up with the ideas for us. Um, getting into the Rules Committee uh, meeting from this past, for this year, um, the Rules Committee is, is made up of uh, 11 members. Uh, myself, President of the League. Uh, there's a Division One teams rep, uh, Matt Reidner, uh, from uh, um, East, Eastern Kentucky. Uh, he was elected by the D1 teams to represent them at this meeting. Uh, Chad Lowe from Ohio State represents the D2 teams, again, an elected position. And then the eight regional directors in Division One uh, make up the rest of the field for the meeting. Um, and as Christian mentioned earlier, uh, Matt's spot on the D as a D1 elected rep is up for re-election. So That'll be coming out this fall in terms of uh, those who are interested in running for that, that election. Uh, the, the committee met on July uh, 15th to discuss, debate, and vote, and establish the rule changes for this 17-18 season coming up. Um, the way the process worked throughout the year is conference coordinators um, and the rules reps collected rules for rule change proposals throughout the year. It might have been September. It might have been the week before the meeting. Uh, teams were constantly... Um, giving feedback as to, hey, I'd like to see this change, I'd like to see that change, here's why. Um, and and those, uh, those folks were gathering all that information, uh, putting it together, getting it organized, and presenting it at this meeting. And everything that was proposed was discussed. Um, absolutely every, you know, if you're a team from, whether you're from Utah or Virginia, if you proposed a rule to the Rules Committee reps or the D1 Regional Directors, it was brought up at this meeting and discussed. It may not have been voted upon. Uh, now, a reason a, uh, a proposed rule change doesn't get voted upon is not a single person in the room supported it enough to, to send it to vote. Um, so, but everything was discussed. Um, now, um, Christian's put together on these slides all the, the rule changes that were approved for this coming season moving forward. I'm just going to pick out a few that I thought were uh, uh, of a special noteworthiness to discuss here today. Um, the first one being... Uh, interleague games between um, schools that have two teams. For example, Ohio State, Penn State, um, Illinois, Maryland, there's a number of others nowadays, so many now that I'm having trouble keeping track, of schools that have Division One and Division Two teams. Um, there's been, for years, there's been proposals that, hey, they should be allowed to play. Ohio State D1 can play Ohio State D2 and count the games. Uh, the Rules Committee did not allow that um, because they felt that there was a conflict of interest there in terms of the, the competition value of the games. Well, it has been passed that they can now play one game against each other and count it uh, during the regular season, just one. Um, and uh, at the D1 level where we have a requirement as to how many non-conference games you play to be eligible for the postseason, that, inter that game amongst your own schools 
uh, D2 team uh, does not count to fulfill that, that uh, non-conference game requirement. That was a big rule change. It's, it's been lobbied for the last couple years and uh, finally got some headway there in terms of uh, making that, bringing that to fruition and making that, that opportunity available to teams that have multiple programs. Uh, a unique rule that was put into place in 17 years, I think we've only had this incident happen once and it happened this year where um, a game was decided, it was rained out. Uh, a team was, in, in the, at the end of six innings, one team A was winning, um, badly. Um, however, in the middle of the sixth inning, the visiting team came back, retied the game, and then the game got washed out by rain. By rule, the score goes back to the last completed full winning, which put the home team as victors, despite the fact the visiting team came up in their half of the top half of the inning was able to tie it up. Uh, so our rule, we had a rule in place that accounted for that. It never happened in 17 years. It happened this year. So we now have a, a little bit of adjustment to the rule in place where a halted game rule is in place in that situation, where if the visiting team were to come back, come from behind, um, and then the game gets washed out, the halted game rule goes into effect, which means the game is stopped, you know, where is, is halted where the game was stopped by weather and picked up and, and finished um, at a later date, provided that that later date falls within the, the weekend of, of the series it's being played. So it's not, so if that game were to get washed out on a Saturday, if the game can be picked up and finished on Sunday, it can be, it can be the halted game rule can go into effect, that game can be fi finished. If, it, if the whole weekend's washed out and the game can't be continued that weekend, then the, then the original rule goes back into place. It regresses to the last completed full inning, and that determines the score of the game. Um, a unique rule that was put into place, um, you know, maybe I'm not hitting the slides enough uh, to, to keep up, but um, we put a cap on the number of non-rostered personnel allowed in the dugout during games. Uh, we've seen this uh, in, in several instances where um, there's a lot of people in the dugout that don't necessarily belong there. Um, whether they're not on the team, they're not on the roster, they're not players. Um, so it's been capped at four. Uh, the team gets to each team gets to decide who those non-rostered players are. Whether they're coaches, coaches, trainers, managers, um, official scores, uh, you get four. Um, so use them wisely. Um, if uh, now player coaches, a player coach is on the roster. So that player coach does not count against one of the four. So you can still have uh, someone's girlfriend keeping the book as a team manager. You could have a trainer. You could have a, a hitting coach and a fielding coach, and there's your four uh, non-rostered dugout personnel that are allowed uh, in the dugout. Uh, a violation of this results in the head coach uh, automatically being ejected from the game. Uh, another rule change uh, at the Division II level was uh, the installation of courtesy runners. I believe we had that many, many years ago. We've now brought it back for the catcher only. Um, so at the D2 level, catchers can get a courtesy runner to move the game along. Um, another interesting uh, uh, rule that was put into place uh, and approved, um, more and more schools are getting access to all turf fields, which, you know, the biggest, there's nobody a bigger fan of turf fields than Christian Smith, who loves them. So um, more and more varsity programs are putting them in which is great from the standpoint of it's hard to damage a turf field, so we're seeing more of our club teams getting permission to use the varsity fields uh, because they're turf. Um, however, a lot of turf fields have some stipulations um, regarding the use of seeds, uh, chewing gum, and metal cleats. So one of the things we've had some complaints about are uh, teams traveling to another school, getting there, finding out they have a turf field that they're not allowed to wear metal cleats on, and they're about to take the field for a game, and now half their team doesn't have appropriate footwear to play for the game. Uh, so now there's a rule in place where uh, if you're the home team and you're using a turf field that has footwear limitations to it, uh, you have 72 hours prior to the first game to notify your opponent of those uh, footwear limitations. Uh, if you fail to do so, um, your team as the home team is required to wear uh, um, I believe the same term, turf shoes, not molded cleats, not metal cleats. You know, even if, uh, even if the other team has uh, all, all appropriate footwear, 
if you didn't notify them that the, the, the turf field in question has uh, footwear requirements, uh, your team is not allowed to wear any sort of cleat on the field for that game. Um, all right, next one. Uh, this, in my, in my opinion, is a very big change to the rules committee that's been approved. Uh, as you probably heard me say, uh, the rules committee is myself, a D1 elected rep, a D2 rep, and then eight Division I regional directors. Um, we have, we, the rules committee voted to amend that uh, to reduce the rules committee from 11 members down to seven. And those seven members will now be uh, myself, uh, the Division I rules committee uh, team rep that's elected, the D2 team rep that's elected, um, the heads of each Division I, Division II, and Division III the operations. So, in the, you know, this year it's Christian in D1, Eric in D2, uh, Alex in D3, and then one Division I regional director that will be elected by his fellow uh, regional directors to represent. Uh, the idea being um, it, it spaces, for one, it, it consolidates the, the, the group that are voting on these rules down to a smaller number, but also it disperses the amount of votes that are D1 heavy or D2 heavy uh, in, in that regard. So, um, you know, there'll be two, two people in the committee directly representing Division Two. There'll be, there'll be three people uh, rep directly representing Division One, and one person directly representing Division Three, and then myself who represents them all. Um, so we think that's a good change to the Rules Committee uh, uh, plan moving forward. Um, on the Division Two side, a couple rules. If you're a Division Two team, pay attention. These rules don't go into effect right away, uh, but they will be coming down the pipeline, so make note of it. Um, effective the 2018-19 season, so not this year, but next year, it will be required that uh, batters' ha helmets must match. Uh, it's not something we enforced at the D2 level in the past. We do at the D1 level. All, all, player pers all players on the field must have matching batting helmets just like they would headwear or game hats. Uh, at the D2 level, that requirement is going to come into place in 18-19. In the 1920 season at Division II, Division II teams will be required to wear, carry two sets of uniforms, a home and away jersey, contrasting colors. Again, something we've had at the D1 level for a number of years now, and we're giving you guys forewarning now that it's coming down so you can prepare your budgets uh, and, and prep for that for the future. Um, again, also in 2018-19, not this year but next year, in D2, similar to like we have in Division I, uh, there will be a minimum requirement for non-conference games played to be eligible for the postseason, and that will be a two. Um, a new rule for, that goes into place for this year for D2 is all teams are eligible to play fall ball. Uh, so throughout the entire D2 uh, structure, the entire land of D2, um, fall ball games will be eligible to be counted in, in, in regular season play, non-conference games, conference games statistics will count and so forth. Um, and, uh, another uh, interesting move that was approved in Division Two was uh, the moving up the dates of uh, D2 district playoffs. I guess we're going to soon stop calling them district playoffs and we'll just call them D2 regional playoffs, but those are going to be moved up a week earlier uh, than they have been in, in the past. And I believe that's it for the, uh, the major rules changes that are going into effect for this year. Of course, all the rules changes um, are available on the slides. Um, you know, the, you'll see the, the new rule books coming out shortly from Christian. I hope you get, the, get those updated out in the next uh, week or so to get those out to everybody. Uh, but those are the highlights of everything that was discussed and, and really the, the major rules that were approved and changed. So I uh, appreciate your time, and uh, I'll hand it back to Christian. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Sandy. Thank you for going over those. Yeah, those are extremely important. Uh, those are the rules that will be going into effect uh, this upcoming season. And as he mentioned, we will have those uh, rule books out uh, hopefully early next week. Um, so look out for those uh, coming out soon. Um, Going to get into our breakout sessions. Uh, we have three breakout sessions that we'll be going over. The first I'll be taking you through its team operations. Uh, the second uh, breakout session will be tournaments and championships. Uh, that will be presented by uh, Eric, Alex, and myself. Actually, that should be uh, Tracy and myself. Um, and then session three will be sponsors and fundraising. A um, whole slew of people will be uh, coming up here to present uh, on their uh, respective uh, sponsors. 
Again, how to ask a question. If you're just joining us, we want to make sure this meeting is interactive. If you ever have a question at any point during this presentation, please just type your name, your team affiliation, and your question into the comment section uh, below the video feed, and we'll do our best to answer that question. Now, as far as team operations go, I'm going to go through a slew of documents and, and some different things that are going to help uh, make your team better. Um, the first and foremost is the league participation agreement, probably the most important document uh, in the league. Uh, if you don't have this into us, you're not an official member. So each year you're going to be sending in a league participation agreement. Um, it basically, the due date's July 1st, so you're uh, uh, well past the due date there. Um, we just need a signature from you your faculty advisor to make that uh, valid um, and you can fa you can fax it or scan an email to us that league participation agreement it's basically your uh, contract that you're going to be a member of the NCBA and it goes through all the uh, the benefits and fees that are associated with the league uh, the registration form is a very an extremely important document this is updated contact information for the team we have tons of important information going out especially in the next few weeks, rule books, equipment order forms, uh, scheduling request forms, that it's imperative that we have the correct contact information for each team. Um, I can only speak on behalf of Division One. I, I know we have 99% of everybody's updated contact information. I think I'm only missing two teams. Um, so we're, we're really good there. But it's like I said, it's a very important document that we need to have so that we're making sure that we're getting the correct, the information out to the correct people. The scheduling request form, I just talked about it. That will be coming out uh, for the teams that play in the spring only. That will be coming out, I believe I have it earmarked for August 25th. Um, the teams that play in the fall, the North Atlantic region, the Great Lakes region, um, the Mid-Atlantic West, and the Mid-America North, they already got their schedule request forms. The North Atlantic region schedule is already out. Uh, I know Great Lakes is coming out very soon. Um, the Mid-America North will be coming out shortly, and uh, the Mid-Atlantic West will be coming out shortly as well. Um, but this form is basically the how we put together the conference schedule. Each team goes week by week and lets us know when they can play, when they can't play, when they need off. And we have a question. Uh, Jacob Hauser, University of Florida, Division II. Uh, I'm just wondering the reasons for moving up the playoffs by a week as a school that plays only spring and could possibly have a seven-team conference, it makes it difficult to schedule out-of-conference games. Yeah, it, it was it was one of those uh, it was one of those that um, you know it, it was highly debated at the rules committee meeting. Um, Eric um, really spearheaded that uh, rule going into place. The head of Division Two, um, I think, the main reason for that was we had a lot of issues with. Um, district playoffs this past year uh, a lot of rain um, had to move a lot of the games into I think we played into Thursday of the next week um, and by moving those district playoffs up a week basically gives us a, a weekend buffer that if for some reason weather comes into play and um, washes out an entire regional tournament that we have another weekend where we can play those regionals so um, it's something that you know, it, it's it's tough. I know it's tough. The spring is short. I understand your concerns, um, and it'll be something that we look at next year. If you want to call this year maybe a, a you know an experiment year where we're going to see how this works out, um, but we'll definitely be looking at it for you know next season to see how it worked this year. Um, but I understand your concerns. They're very valid concerns, and um, again, we'll be monitor monitoring it this year, but. Keep in mind, as a team in the South, we did pass that you can play fall conference games. So you can knock out some conference series in the fall. You can play, which will lighten your load in the spring uh, to you know, free up some weekends to play some, uh, some games in the spring. But it's a good question, and I guess the only answer I can give for you is that it will be reevaluated next year after this uh, first year happens. Um, but good question. But back to the scheduling request form. Um, each team lists home, away, off when they're filling out that schedule request form, and that's how we build the conference schedule. So it's very important that you fill that out accurately. Uh, it's very important that you have the academic calendar open for your school when filling that out so you know when spring breaks are, you know when exams are, 
uh, you know when campus festivals are so that you can request off those certain weeks so that we don't schedule you because you don't know how many times every year we get teams you know we put the conference schedule out and they come to us and say hey we have you know our spring breaks that weekend and I look back at the schedule request form and see that they can play that weekend so it's imperative that you have the academic or excuse me your academic calendar open um, so that you know all the dates are accurate you are able to play when you say you are able to play so that there's not changes having to be made um, so it's important that schedule request it's going to be coming out for a majority of you um, to take your time on it to make sure that you're filling it out accurately uh, because again that's how we put the conference schedule together everybody is covered under our general liability insurance uh, certificate um, at the end of the day what this is fantastic for is if you're looking for a field off campus uh, whether it's a park and rec field um, or a local high school field they're gonna nine times out of ten they're gonna require insurance this insurance certificate covers that so if you go to a high school field and they say well you, we need an insurance just talk to us and we'll take care of it um, there is a seventy five dollar uh, charge for that service of adding a third party to our insurance um, but it's very easily taken care of um, so that is something to keep in mind when reserving your fields is that you are covered by insurance um, so you don't have to worry about you know are we covered by insurance you are so that's something that uh, you don't have to worry about one other side note to this it's not a medical insurance policy um, you know if you get hurt on the field you can't take this policy to the ER and say hey here's my insurance that's not what it covers um, it is strictly for uh, general liability it's not a medical insurance policy reserving fields as soon as that conference schedule comes out which the North Atlantic your conference schedules out you know when you're playing home games start reserving your fields now do not procrastinate on that start doing it as soon as that conference schedule comes out because you want to be on those fields before anybody else snatches them up um, so it's very important you don't procrastinate there um, make sure that you're letting your opponents know where the games are being played um, where you reserve the field and one nice feature of the new website is you are able to put in the details of the games the location game time uh, and stuff like the address things like that so make sure you're letting your opponents know where you're playing I think that goes without saying obviously and again when you're reserving those fields if the word insurance comes up contact us we'll walk you through the process on how to get that field on our insurance party as a third party additional insured obviously don't wait wait till the week before you play to reserve your fields you'll be in a, a heap of mess um, if you do that again just as soon as that conference schedule comes out start reserving those fields if you're having trouble reserving fields we're great assets we're constantly looking for fields for regional playoffs uh, World Series events um, so we're a great asset we have a lot of uh, like Google Earth we're able to look uh, you know aerial views of certain areas so we're a, a great asset for you guys if you're if you're in need of looking for a field scheduling umpires um, as an NCB the home team is required to have two high school certified umpires at each game um, that's something else that as soon as the conference schedule comes out schedule the umpires if you don't know how to schedule umpires the best course of action especially for the new teams um, the best course of action is to talk to a local high school um, see who they use talk to the head coach there talk to the, the athletic director they'll be able to point you in the right direction on on who to uh, to contact to reserve umpires a big thing we have rules in place you know if the umpires aren't there 30 minutes you know after the start time it's a forfeit so you want to make sure that you're reconfirming dates times with these umpires so it's good to have a good open communication line with those umpires so that you know they're going to show up when they're supposed to show up um, so another important aspect of the regular season is making sure you get those schedule those umpires scheduled the online player registration this was a new registration system that we put in with the new website that we unveiled last year it was pretty much the same way that we've had it in previous years it was updated just a bit um, but this is for players and player coaches um, every single person that steps on the field as a player player coach they have to register with the NCBA 
um, and it's a very simple process. You just go to the club baseball website, you click the login button, you put in your email and your password. If you forgot your password, there's a forgot password link that you can click on. It will walk you through getting a new password set up. Um, but it's very straightforward. A lot of the information is, is captured from previous years. You don't even have to enter it. But this what determines eligibility. Um, you, at, you answer certain questions, and you at the end of the registration process, we as a league are able to see if you're eligible or you're not. You either show up red, ineligible, or you show up green, eligible. Um, a lot of people think, a lot of players think once they register that they're on the roster, and that is not the case. Um, we'll be talking about an academic eligibility letter probably next slide um, that that kind of finalizes you getting on the roster. But once you register, you're not on the roster yet. You're put into what's called a registration queue. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, you also need to know a team code, a specific team code for your team uh, when registering and your team manager will have that access to that team code to give to all the players that when they register they can put in the team code and finalize their registration process. Instructions on for the team managers on how to get that team code will be going out shortly to all the teams. So um, if you don't know what that's about, don't worry. We have information going out about that very shortly. Um, in the past, we got a lot of questions. Um, in the past, at the end, you had to pay a $1 fee. That's no more with this new registration process. Um, so that's nothing you have to worry about. Um, as far as coaches go, so if you, have an, if you have any questions about the online player registration, if you're having issues with it, always reach out to us. Um, as far as non-player coaches, guys that aren't on the field, guys that are in the dugout, the head coach, a uh, bench coach that aren't playing in the game, they need to fill out a waiver as well. It's not an online process. It's a document on the info tab. It's listed as a coach's waiver. You just click on the document, download it, print it off, fill it out, print it off, and then sign it and send that into the NCBA. That will allow you guys to be, you non-player coaches, to be in the dugouts. Uh, the academic eligibility letter, which I briefly touched on when we were talking about the player registration process. The academic eligibility letter, there's two types of eligibility in the NCBA. There's the NCBA eligibility, where you have to meet certain eligibility requirements, but there's also academic eligibility. And we can't determine that, the school has to determine that. And how we get that determination is from the academic eligibility letter. Um, we have two sample formats online that you can download and, and use. Um, a lot of teams utilize those. Um, I think the better one's the sample number two. I think that's the one we in the, in the office like better. Um, <coughs> but you can use either one. Um, doesn't, doesn't matter to us. But basically, that form you fill out, you just list all your players on that form. And at the top of the academic eligibility letter, it lists all the academic eligibility requirements. You have to be have at least a cumulative 2.0 GPA, full time. Can't be on academic probation or warning. So those are listed up at the top. You list all your players below that. You take that to the registrar, and they sign off. And if you don't have a guy that meets one of those requirements, the registrar will cross that player off. Um, once that is completed and signed by the registrar, if it doesn't have an official registrar stamp or seal on it, or university stamp or seal, it has to be sent to the league by the person who signed off on it. And the reason behind that is, in the past, we've had teams forge signatures, so we're hopefully closing that loophole. Question. Uh, Todd Murphy, uh, for the regional playoff seating, if two teams are tied with the same record, now the overall winning percentage is the tiebreaker. Is there any way to take into consideration strength of schedule? For example, a D2 team that plays a D1 non-conference game versus the other team only playing their conference games and one team playing 20 games versus just playing 11 or 12. Um, I would have to look at that written down, but I believe, Alex, the, the question is determining seeding for what? Uh, playoff seeding. Playoff seeding. I believe our seeding is in the rule book um, as far as how we seed the, the regional teams with, you know, the at-large bid is the automatic uh, four seed, and the conference uh, winners are seeded based on certain criteria, um, and strength of schedule is not in that, in that criteria. Um, so we wouldn't be taking that into account. Um, I hope I answered that correctly. Um, but yeah, that, that's in the rule book. 
um, as far as how we see those those conference winners for the, the regional playoffs. Um, now back to the academic eligibility letter. Um, we get that from the, the registrar. We take that letter and then we look at all the players that have registered online and we look at Joe Smith. He's eli academic elig academically eligible and he's registered. We add him to the roster and just do that for every player. At that point, that is when you're on the roster. It's not when after you register. We have to register and have a academic eligibility letter turned in. Um, so if if you're not listed on the roster, you can go to your team and look at your roster. If your name's not there, you're not eligible to play. Um, so make sure that you're on the roster. There are certain steps that need to happen in order to have an official roster. Um, we'll also have be information out about how to get an uh, eligible roster online very shortly because um, we do have teams coming up playing um, late September, early October for Division Two teams, probably early September or mid-September. So um, it's important to know exactly how to get on the roster. And if you have any questions about it at any time, please let us know. But we will have information out to you. So if you're concerned, don't be too concerned right now at least. Um, uploading player stats and team information. I want to touch on the stats part of this. Um, we talked about it before in the rules. You have to have your entire team's stats up in order to have your, your player and pitcher of the week's nominations to be considered. Um, so that's just an incentive for you guys to get the stats up. It's also nice to see your name at, at the top of the home run leaders on the website or RBI leaders or you know, if you're a pitcher, uh, you know, the, the best ERA in the, in, the, um, in the league. So it's nice to have those stats up. Um, not a lot of teams put them up for reasons unknown, um, maybe for scouting purposes, or they just don't know how to. Um, so uploading player stats, it's done by the team. We don't put the stats up. The teams put the stats up. The team manager, um, they'll have access to do it. It's very simple. Um, for the teams to do it and again team managers will be given uh, information on how to obtain a team code but they'll also be given information on how to um, upload stats to the website and like I said it's very easy um, something that all teams should, should consider doing especially if you want your players um, you know considered for the player and pitcher of the week honors and national player of the pitch pitcher of the week honors um, so that's that's nice to have also what's great about our website not a lot of people know about it or teams know about it. every team has their own specific website on our website where you can put your Twitter you can put your schedule you can put uh, a number of things Instagram anything you want to you can design it how you like team picture um, not a lot of teams take advantage of it um, I think it's a lot of teams just don't know that that access is there um, but that is through this you know team information you can upload all that to the website and it's something that's really nice um, you know I know a lot of teams have their own websites off the NCBA website um, but you have the ability to have your own built-in website to our website which is really nice feature of the new website and we hope that teams will uh, take advantage of that um, again how to ask a question we've had a lot of great questions uh, asked over the course uh, of the presentation but if you're maybe just joining us Type your team name, your name, your team name, um, and your question into the comments section below the, uh, the feed, and we will uh, answer that question to our best of our ability. Still going. Um, the weekly team submi submission form. Um, this is another important document. If we don't get the weekly team submission form, we can't upload scores. We rely on you guys to fill out the weekly team submission form, which gives us your opponent's name, the scores for the weekend series, and your nominations for player and pitcher of the week. Um, we use that to upload the scores to the website. We also use those to pick um, the player and pitchers of the week that fe are featured on the conference pages. Um, NCBA dues, those, uh, er every team in the NCBA, D1, D2, D3, they're getting two BB Core certified bats. Um, I believe one is the D Marini and another one is a Louisville Slugger. Um, D1 teams are getting six dozen official NCBA Rawlings baseballs, uh, while five dozen Rawlings baseballs will be given to the Division II and Division III teams. 
Um, the Division I teams will also um, be given their choice of either eight uh, batting helmets or a complete set of catcher's gear. <coughs> um, all teams are also covered under that $2 million general liability policy. Um, the performance bond. We have a performance bond set in place for D1. We've had it in place for a number of years. Um, we're hopeful that the it's deterring teams from forfeiting games, which uh, the data has shown that we are teams are forfeiting less, and we're hopeful that the performance bond is the leading cause of that. Um, we have implemented it at the Division II level. The reason being uh, is we got a lot of the teams that uh, weren't performing as well at the D2 level down to D3, so Division II is going to be much more competitive, much more uh, organized. Um, so that is why we put the performance bond in place is because these teams um, are going to be much more uh, organized and forfeiting less. And that's what we're hoping, hoping for. And hopefully that performance bond will deter teams from doing that. Um, the dues amounts uh, for each league, 2100 for D1 and then 1625 for D2 and D3. Um, those are due by February 28th. So you got plenty of time to fundraise, um, collect player dues, all that to make sure you get those dues payments in on time. There is a $100 discount uh, if you pay the dues uh, in full by December 31st. So a Division One team, if you pay them in full by December 31st, you only have to pay 2000 instead of that 2100 Save 100 bucks. Just get the dues paid. Um, it's simple. We accept check which is the best way of doing it. Um, but we also can, uh, set, we'll, there will be invoices sent to you where you can pay online with a credit card. Um, but there, those payments are subject to an online handling fee. Um, the invoices will be sent out to Genie or from Genie. Um, the big thing to remember is that these invoices are, are sent through a software system that we have in our accounting office. And it's gonna come through as Intuit by QuickBooks, I believe is what the email is gonna say. A lot of people see that and just delete it. Um, if you do see an email from Intuit by QuickBooks, more than likely that's going to be an invoice from the league. So try not to delete it. But if you do and you need us uh, to send you another one, we can easily do that. Um, and just for references, if you do need our employee identification number, uh, it is listed there, 52-227091. And it's also listed on all of our invoices. We have a question. Uh, Benji Wilson, West Virginia University. What does it take to add another team, in our case, Division III? Uh, it's very simple. I mean, if you have uh, a large turnout uh, down in Morgantown, it's very easy. Uh, just reach out to us. Uh, reach out to Alex Kane, actually, is the person that you're going to want to reach out to. If you want to start a Division III program that might be a, a feeder system for your D2 program, um, very simple, just the, the first step is to contact Alex and he can walk you through the process on what you need to do in order to get that uh, second team or B team, whatever you want to call it, uh, into the league. Now these uh, next few points we're going to be talking about is just about operating your team, boosting team interest, boosting team morale, um, and as far as boosting team interest, we have a number of teams that come to us that say their numbers are down, they don't know how to recruit new players uh, and w these are just some ideas that you can look at and maybe implement with your team um, the biggest of which is getting a table at a, um, at a club university fair uh, where incoming freshmen are coming in and getting to see all the different clubs available on campus that's a great asset for you guys most if not all colleges do that colleges and universities do that um, so that's something to look into um, that's a great way to recruit freshmen, new and coming uh, students to the university, to the team. Um, obviously, getting in the school newspaper, putting flyers around campus. Um, these are all things that are, are, are no-brainers, but um, you know, you'll be shocked at how many uh, interested students you'll get to come out to tryouts or to come out to a team meeting. Um, the, at the end of the day, you just want to make sure your presence is known on campus. Now, as far as, far as boosting team morale, number one uh, point we have there is get together as much as you can off the field whether it's getting a house for the team or you know for you know a couple apartments for the team that uh, you know you're, you're with each other on a constant basis um, you know having social events going to dinner 
Um, going to the spring training showcase is a big one that we'll talk about as far as boosting that team morale um, that you can you can get into. Um, we always talk about breaking up the clicks. You know, you know, seniors always stay with seniors on road trips, and you know, best buddies always stay with best buddies on road trips. Have seniors stay with freshmen, or you know, juniors stay with freshmen on road trips, so you can learn about each other. That's just going to boost the team chemistry on the field. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, but there's all certain different ways that we have listed here on the slides of boosting that team morale. And if you boost the team morale, your product on the field is going to be that much better. So when you're off the field, making sure to do some of these things will obviously make your, uh, your product on the field that much better. Budgeting. Um, another hugely important aspect of your club baseball program is to set an accurate budget. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of club teams out, out there that don't have a budget. Their budget is collecting player dues, and they're hopeful at the end of the year that they're able to, you know, be in the positive and not have to, you know, pull money out of their own pocket, uh, the president's pocket. So it's important to set a budget. I mean, include everything. Look at the worst-case scenario. If you think umpires are going to be 70, but they might be 85, go with the 85 number so that you have a worst-case expense number. Um, you know, what are your what is your revenues? Is it just players, player dues? Is it player dues and fundraising? Is it the school contributing money? Those are all things to think about. It's very easy to set up a budget. We have sample budgets that we can provide to you. Um, so it's very important that you get an accurate budget in place so that you know at the end of the year you're going to have money. Money usually doesn't go bad. It rolls over from year to year. So that's something to keep in mind. Another thing is we have so many teams that at the end of the year, they're dry. They have no money. Um, always budget for the postseason. Always. Uh, maybe not looking like you're going to have a good year this year, but you never know. So always put, you know, budget in place for the postseason. Something to think about. Player dues. How much to charge? Uh, that's always a question we get is how much do we charge players? And it runs the gamut. Um, there's some teams that charge five, six hundred dollars a guy. Maybe it's five hundred, six hundred dollars a semester. Um, we have teams that maybe only charge a couple hundred dollars. Um, maybe some charge teams don't charge any. I've, I haven't heard of that, but maybe that's the case. Um, you need to remember what's included with being a part of the team. You know, is, are we doing a spring training trip? You know, are we having two sets of uniforms? Travel costs. Those all need to be incorporated into those dues. Um, obviously, if there's more included, you need to have higher dues. Um, it's just a simple supply and demand. You know, lots of interest, you know, the higher, higher the dues. Um, make them pay as soon as they join the team. Uh, you don't know how many times we hear of a guy comes in, plays a couple games, and then flakes off and you never see him again. Um, that hurts the team, obviously, but it hurts the budget as well. So make sure players are paying their dues on time uh, when they're when they're needed. Um, just a simple idea is if you do have tryouts, charge five bucks for tryouts. Um, that's something to just boost your budget and your revenues. Team equipment and uniforms. Um, we're going to be talking about all the different uh, sponsors that we have in the NCBA, Rawlings, DeMarini, um, you know, Avis, New Balance, we'll be discussing all those here in the future. Um, but a lot of these items that we offer, they're all custom. So those require longer lead time. So make sure you're ordering as soon as possible so that, you know, you're not come game time, you got games and you don't have uniforms. Make sure you're ordering on time early so that uh, you, you're sure you have your uniforms uh, when you need them. Hats. You know, we hear it all the time, too, is, you know, we don't know how many hats to order. Order extra. They're not going to go bad. Use them as a fundraiser. Sell them to mom and dad. They'll buy them. Um, so order extra hats. Order extra pants. Uh, those things rip. Order extra game balls. Um, I think the, the, you know, the what we need to do, what you need to do is order extra of things um, because things happen and you need to have that in place. Also, we have discounts if you order early. For instance, Rawlings, if you're in, uh, if you order now, it's a higher discount than if you order uh, later in the year. I think that Paul will talk about it, but I think it's the end of November is that cutoff. Um, so make sure you're ordering early. The Guide to Collegiate Club Baseball. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's kind of run 
it's very bland. It was very bland. It was a Word document. It was very mundane. I don't think a lot of people knew about it. It had a lot of great information on it, uh, but just not a lot of people knew about it. Not a, a lot of people wanted to invest their time in reading it. Um, well, we've launched a new format, which is Prezi, which I wasn't familiar with, to be honest with you, but the, uh, the younger guys in the office uh, were familiar with it. Uh, we've converted it to a Prezi. We feel that it's much more interactive, uh, much more user-friendly, uh, much more exciting to use. Um, and those, the, the guide to collegiate club baseball is all on the D1, D2, and D3 sites under the info tab. So check that out. Um, I know Alex will be utilizing it when he's uh, bring, talking to new teams because it has a lot of great informative information. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now is in that Prezi um, guide to collegiate club baseball. So if you have some time, check it out. If you're a new team, I definitely highly recommend you checking that out. Um, you know, some of the chapter titles, what is the NCBA? Just giving you a background on our league. Um, starting a team at your school. So if you're a new team, this is going to go through all the steps that you need to go through in order to become a, uh, a become a or officially recognized student organization or club sport on your campus. Um, also goes into joining the NCBA, uh, what you need to do that. And then we get into operating in the NCBA. We're talking about, you know, the preseason work, what you're doing in season, and then the postseason work as well. Um, making your team better, fundraising and sponsors are also chapter titles. Um, and again, all those chapters, the entire guide or just certain ch uh, titles, chapters, excuse me, uh, can be downloaded. I think this is my last slide. I hope it is because my voice is going. Um, session one, <laughs> team operation. The timetable for this upcoming year, um, you see July 1st, that was the renewal uh, for our new team and LPA deadline, the renewal for the new team and LPA deadline. Um, August 10th, which so happens to be today, is our uh, should be 18th annual league meeting. Um, schedule request forms due August 4th and September 1st. Those are approximate dates. Um, August 4th is for the teams that play in the fall. September 5th, or excuse me, September 1st uh, for the teams that are spring only. Um, we hope to release the conference schedules uh, by August 15th for the fall teams. And for the spring teams, we hope to have those out by September 15th. Um, North Atlantic region, that is already released. The September 8th, that is when the fall season officially begins, uh, which I believe is the second, um, second Friday in September. And November 12th is when the fall season concludes, which I believe that is the second Sunday in November. December 31st, we talked about that. That is our deadline to get that discount on the annual league dues. So make sure to put that in your calendar to make sure to take advantage of that $100. Uh, February 1st slash 15th, that's the official start of uh, the spring conference season. And then February 28th, that is the deadline to get the dues in. Uh, worst case scenario to get those in is, is February 28th. Uh, we just have the month of March. That's our spring training showcase. Tracy will be up here. Um, to talk about the spring training showcase. We're really excited about it. Um, you've probably heard, I'll let her uh, let you know where we are going for 2018, um, but we're excited about that. Um, and I know any of the teams that have ever participated in that event will just speak so highly of it. So that's something that you're interested in. Stay tuned because we'll be talking about the spring training showcase here very shortly. April 15th is the roster freeze. After that point, you can no longer add guys to your roster. Um, April 22nd is when the D2 regular season concludes. Um, May 6th is when the Division I regular season concludes. Then we're talking about district and regional playoffs. Um, D2, again, is a week earlier. That is April 27th through the 29th. Uh, D1 will be as normal May 11th through the 13th. And then we have our World Series. Uh, Division II in Pittsburgh, Kansas, May 18th through the 22nd. And then uh, May 25th through the 31st, 2018, we will be hosting our Division I World Series down in Holly Springs, uh, North Carolina. <coughs> now, session two, we're going to be uh, going to be talking with Eric, myself, and Tracy. We're going to be going through the team invitational tournaments, NCBA fall tournaments that we're hosting, uh, the spring training showcase that Tracy will be uh, talking about, the D2 district playoffs, D2 World Series. Uh, D1 regional tournaments and the D1 World Series. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Eric um, to get into our team invitational tournaments and fall tournaments. 
Thank you, Christian. The, uh, the first step of our breakout sessions, like Christian was mentioning, is uh, the team invitational tournaments. Um, first and foremost, it's they're used as great fundraisers for all the teams. I mean, not only are you playing baseball to, you know, obviously make yourself better and more prepared for the spring, but you have a great chance to, you know, increase your budgets, increase, you know, everything for you for the spring. Um, you know, we're great resources for you guys if you need hotels, um, facilities. We have great networking with cities all around the country. Um, we've helped, con excuse me, uh, events all around the country. So. Um, definitely use us as a resource. Uh, we're here to help you guys. You know, everything from the sponsors, the hotels, like I was saying, to umpires, facilities, everything um, across the board. So let us know. Fall tournaments. These are the tournaments that we're running in-house. The first one is the Greenville Fall Invitational, set, uh, November 3rd to the 5th. It's the sixth annual. They have 16 teams. Current directors are Rachel Weber and Tracy Reardon. I know they have a, uh, a waiting list, but uh, if you want to get on that, contact them. Um, yeah, it's a great event. I've uh, been down there the last five or six years, and it's, uh, it's a good time. Wood Wars down in Texas, October, October 6th through the 8th, 16 teams. Wood Bat, if anybody knows Ryan Norris, it's a, uh, it's a fantastic event. He does a swing it challenge. Um, you know, he's got a DJ down there. He does a lot of great things for the teams, and uh, it's, uh, it's worth, worth your time and money. It'll get you prepared for the spring as well. So contact Ryan Norris. His email is on the screen there. Battle Creek Blast, Bailey Park, September 22nd through the 24th. It's the fourth annual. Uh, Alex Gannon in our office is running it, 12 teams, but he is looking for four more. His contact information is right there as well. So if you have any interest in joining the event, um, any questions about it, you know, contact him. Butler County Classic uh, down in September 22nd, 24th. Christian Smith is uh, heading up the event, and he uh, has 12 teams, or looking for 12 teams, but, you know, room for more, looking to add maybe 16. So Wood Bat, tournament director, um, information right there on the screen. So. Henderson Fall Invitational, uh, October 20th through the 22nd. It's the second annual. As of right now, they're looking for more teams. Um, looking to shoot for eight, maybe 12. It's right outside of Las Vegas. So, I mean, it's obviously a good time there. Obviously, you can play some baseball as well. So, tournament director, Norm Doyle, email on the screen. Bring up Tracy Rudin. She's going to talk some uh, spring training for you guys. Okay, as Eric said, um, I have taken over the Director of Spring Training Operations for the upcoming season. Um, last year was in Tampa and Plant City, um, as it has been for the past 11 or 12 years. Um, there were 60 NCBA teams and also the Rawlings Free Agent team. Um, 147 games were played over the month of March with all of our club members, so I mean, if you're looking to get some reps in for the spring, it's definitely the chance to come down and do that. Um, we have sponsors for the event, Hooters, Press Box, McDinton's, uh, Beach Bar, and Circle K Subway. Um, every team gets VIP cards for all the players to get the discounts from the local sponsors. And of course, Red Bull is kind enough to give us Red Bull to hand out to all of you players when you come down to help you with those early morning games. Um, for the spring training event, we have great accommodations and rates. Um, there's a lot to do in your spare time. You can set your schedule and request certain days off if you'd like to do beach trips or do an MLB spring training game. Um, we're also very close to other areas in Florida where there are other spring break destination places that you might want to visit. Um, we're doing individual hotel contracts, so we're going to get really great deals for you guys for rooming. And three of the 2017 World Series teams participated in spring training this year, and that was Penn State, um, UCF, and Ohio, State, um, Ohio State's D2 team. Uh, the showcase is definitely a great atmosphere. A bunch of our staff have played in it and also have just been there to be staff. Um, but it really is just a great time and bonding experience overall. A lot of people do recommend it, like Christian was saying earlier. A lot of teams who go are returning members that go year after year because of how the team bonding um, takes place down there. Uh, you get to know the guys on other club teams in a more relaxing atmosphere and it's just a lot of fun to kind of shake off the rust from the winter and get ready for the spring season. And it's also a great opportunity to play teams that you wouldn't normally play during your regular uh, conference series. So um, you get to kind of see how you measure up to teams across the country. And as always, we're recruiting players for the free agent team. I know some of our staff members are chomping at the bit again to play, some not so much. But um, if you're interested in that, <laughs> uh, 
contact uh, Alex Kane and he'll be happy to help you there. Um, we're also, we also have the inaugural spring training West Coast um, series last year, CMU, Montebello, and Sonoma State. Um, the costs for that are similar to the East Coast spring training. Um, all the prices are listed there. If you have any questions about anything in particular, please either contact myself or Alex. Um, NCB rule, NCBA rules do apply, and the registration for both the East Coast and the West Coast are now open. Um, so if you're interested in either one of the tournaments, please reach out to myself, and I will get you all of the information that you need. Um, games do count towards the overall record and your statistics. And the early registration deadline, if you want to save money, is November 15th. Um, and once that deadline does hit, the price to register does increase. So if you're one of those teams who comes every year, be sure to get your stuff in by the 15th so you can save uh, you know, a couple extra dollars there. And as Christian said, we have signed again with Tampa for 2018. Um, costs again are listed there. NCBA rules do apply. Um, registration, like I said, is now open. And all the teams in our leagues should have received some kind of information about registration. Um, if you haven't and are interested, like I said, please get in touch with me. And the early registration deadline, again, is November 15th. Um, this year, we are not working with a third party. Um, teams are required to stay in approved hotels by us that we are contracting individually. Um, since we aren't using a third party this year, that means the prices and experience you have will be a lot better and we're going to get you a lot better rates. Um, the hotels know about the showcase since we've worked with a lot of them in the past, so they're going to be able to assist you if any kind of issues do arise. Um, and they're very easy to schedule because they know that we come down there year after year. Um, hotels also do provide sponsorship for our event and it helps keep the game fees low, which I know you guys appreciate because it is a rather expensive trip to come down, but it is affordable as long as you plan ahead of time. And for travel purposes, Avis, as Alex will talk about later on, is our discounted and rental car official sponsor of our league and they waive the under under 25 fee which is extremely beneficial to all of our member teams and eric's going to come back up to talk about the district 2 playoffs thank you tracy um, so looking back towards last year 2017 the district playoffs uh, we had eight of those all across the country in 2017 all eight were at a neutral site um, one thing that Christian did mention earlier, we're always open to recommendations. Um, we are not aware of every single field throughout the country. So if you guys have a, a nice home field, especially a turf field, anything that could be a, a nice resource to us, please let us know. We're always open and uh, looking for more possibilities throughout the country. Seven of the eight district playoffs featured four conference winners last year, while District 8 had three conference winners and at large. And as Christian mentioned earlier as well, the thing we're really excited for for your alignment this year is all eight districts or regions I guess you can call them now will have an at-large bid so um, more teams will be qualifying for the playoffs you know competing for the whole year which is, uh, is exciting news through these district playoffs um, the NCBA covers all the field costs game balls and umpires so basically you know you qualify for your spot show up and you compete the teams receive discounted hotels we set up exclusive blocks throughout the country for you guys um, get you exclusive rates um, same idea as spring training. These teams know your, or excuse me, the hotels know you're coming, so they know what to expect. They're able to work with us and the teams, so it makes it easier for everybody. Um, championship plaques, you get the opportunity to play postseason baseball, and most importantly, you get to win a regional championship and you know qualify for the World Series national championship. This past year, we were in Pittsburgh, Kansas. It was our third year there. Um, JC Ballpark, turf infield. We had the host hotel of the uh, Lamp Lamplighter Inn & Suites. Outstanding combinations. They gave us great rates, great location, great amenities that worked very well for our staff and all the teams there. Um, There's great restaurants and night nightlife as Pittsburgh, Kansas is a college town. Pittsburgh State University is there. Um, obviously a member of our NCBA. And great local sponsors and support. This is just a breakdown of uh, the money that we allocate as a stipend towards the in a sense that we were excited to do the same things we Sorry. And we're excited to, you know, offer the same amenities that we can to the event, to the teams, and the experience for everybody. Um, at the same time, we're giving you guys the same travel stipend as well. So 
Um, it's exciting for us, and hopefully that will go up in future years as well. The 2018 World Series, it's our last year at the Pittsburgh, Kansas contract. It's our fourth year. Um, that's not saying we're not going to go back there in the future, but it's just the last year of our contract. And some of the factors that we look into with, um, with Pittsburgh, Kansas are the field availability, the venue quality, the lights, geographic location, the rental cost, um, local attendance, and the eagerness of local organizers. You know, we get every time, hey, why don't you come here for the World Series, or why aren't you, you know, more conscious of, you know, everybody's needs? Well, first and foremost, it's impossible to make everybody happy. But with Pittsburgh, Kansas, it's a great central location throughout the United States. Um, the city there has been great with us to, you know, give us everything we can need, give us all the resources we can need. Um, not like a big city that, you know, doesn't really value us, while Pittsburgh, Kansas does value us. So they do a great job in assisting us to anything we could need with the event and to, uh, you know, do everything to make it a first-class event with us. I'll bring back Christian Smith, and uh, he's going to do the same spiel, but on the D1 side of things. Thank you, Eric. Um, as far as the Division I regional tournaments, as in all of our regional tournaments, our goal is to find neutral sites uh, for all the teams in a specific region. Um, we take pride in, in finding a location that's equidistant for all the teams involved. Um, we always have a lot of team, or excuse me, cities interested in hosting these regional tournaments just due to the economic impact of bringing teams in. Um, but we are, I think Eric mentioned, if, if you have an idea, especially a turf field, which we love, you have an idea for uh, you know one that's maybe close by to campus please let us know that we would love that um, I know specifically in the North Atlantic region uh, Drexel I worked with Drexel and we used their home field um, for the regional tournament which was a turf field that uh, was a great success and really helped helped us get in the regional tournament this year um, all eight districts have regional tournaments uh, we talked about it Loyola Maryland had a question yes all eight districts will have an at-large bid, meaning there will be three conference winners. Uh, we'll get an automatic bid, uh, but the second place finishers, an at-large selection committee, will be looking at the three second place finishers and picking uh, who we feel is the uh, most deserving of going to regionals. Um, again, just as, as Eric mentioned, we're finding hotels with discounted rates uh, that aren't gonna price gouge you. Um, championship trophies are going to obviously be presented to the winning team. Um, you're not going to have to pay for those umpires or field costs or anything like that. The only thing that you'll be uh, coming out of your pocket is a travel cost, which are you know gas and, and hotel. Um, and again, please, if you have any recommendations for host sites, we would love to hear them. We absolutely would. So please reach out to us if you have a good uh, good site for us. The 2017 NCBA D1 World Series. Uh, it was in Holly Springs, North Carolina, and I was, it was it's the first year of a two-year contract, so we'll be going back there in 2018. Um, Sandy alluded to it in the introduction of, uh, of this presentation. Um, it was, in my opinion, maybe I'm biased, but it was th the best event we've ever hosted. Uh, just from the quality of the venue, which was a brand new Ting Stadium, which was when we played there was formerly known uh, as North, Ma North, uh, North Main Athletic Complex. Um, just a state-of-the-art, brand new, all turf, um, an exception of the, the dirt mound uh, venue in a great location, Raleigh, North Carolina, um, right outside Raleigh, North Carolina, and Holly Springs, which was easy for teams to get to, fly into, especially, you know, the teams on the West Coast. Before we were in Paducah and, you know, Colorado State or, you know, whoever it was, Nevada had to fly into Nashville and then drive another two hours up to Paducah. What's great about Holly Springs is right outside Raleigh, and uh, you just fly right into Raleigh-Durham International Airport, drive 15 minutes, and you're Holly Springs. So just all the check boxes that we look for at a venue for hosting our World Series were checked, and we're so excited to go back in 2018. Um, I can't express how excited I am, um, and the city is. The city, the eight teams that went down there, um, they know that the the city rolled out the red carpet for all those eight teams, which a lot of times doesn't happen. A lot of times when we go to a World Series event, you know, it's basically the, the city gives us the key to the stadium and says good luck. Um, that wasn't the case in Holly Springs. They really rolled out the red carpet. They made it less as a tournament and more as an experience for the teams and fans. So we're really, really, really excited um, that we'll be back in 2018 and hopefully for, for many years after that. Um, we did have practice 
facilities at Womble Park. Um, and we had ho our host hotels, the Doubletree and the Hilton Garden Inn, which, you know, are obviously synonymous with just great properties, great, to great hotel properties. Um, they were great to us, the teams, um, just fantastic all around from them. Um, obviously, Holly Springs being right outside Raleigh, um, there's a lot of great nightlife uh, and things to do, restaurants um, down there. And um, what we're really, really proud about is this next point. Our attendance increased 120% uh, from the previous year, um, which is outstanding. And, and I know there was some factors, ECU, which was who made the World Series was, uh, you know, 90 minutes away. I know that factored into it. Um, but if you were down at the World Series, the experience down there was incredible. Um, so we're really, really proud of that number. Um, another number we're really proud about is the sponsorship. Local sponsorship increased 560%, which is huge. Um, and that is all in part to the city. Um, I didn't do anything. I had did not have my hands in that at all. The city got all those local sponsors on board showing support for this event. So we're really really proud that uh, we're working with uh, the city of holly springs the city uh, uh, of holly springs chamber of commerce the coastal plain league um, holly springs salamanders all those people had you know just great input in this uh, event being such a huge success um, and also sandy touched on it in the introduction it was the greatest championship game maybe the greatest game in general in world series history uh, between east carolina and ucf it was one nothing EC1 in the, uh, with a single in the bottom of the 10th. Um, just incredible, incredible experience. Um, I'm just thrilled of how things worked out. So um, it was a great event. And uh, again, just really excited for 2018. Um, that should say 2017 World Series up at the top. Apologize for that. Um, but this gives you a breakdown of the s travel stipends that we have given out. Uh, to the teams over the course of every single World Series. Um, you will see this year we were actually able to increase it to 7,500, uh, which is a 7% increase. And that is strictly due to the local uh, Chamber of Commerce down in Holly Springs, Scott Manning, um, bringing in those local sponsorship dollars. Those went right back into the team's pocket. Um, so that's why we really, really encourage the teams to go out and utilize those sponsors because they're basically putting money back into your pocket so the more they see you the more they want to invest into the the event so moving forward we're hopeful that the sponsors that were at the 2017 world series will be back on for 2018 and that uh, our teams at the 2018 world series um, will really utilize those sponsors so that uh, we can keep increasing that number again uh, you know picture of uh, North Main, excuse me, Ting, um, Ting Stadium right there. Um, it was formerly known as North Main Athletic Complex. We'll be going back there in 2018. So all you Division I teams, you're in store for just an amazing experience. So uh, I hope that uh, makes you work that much harder to get to the uh, D1 World Series. 2018 Division Three World Series. Um, you know, this is something that Again, when we're talking D3, we're still in the infancy stages. We're still figuring some things out. Um, but we are looking for a Division Three World Series site. Um, if you have a recommendation, please send it to us. Uh, we're all ears. We want to see what you have. We're obviously looking for turf, um, but natural grass works as well. Um, as of right now, we are planning to have this as a four-team double elimination tournament. It'll kind of be formatted. Uh, like a regional tournament would be uh, over just a weekend, uh, double elimination. Um, the winners of each district, the four districts, will be represented at the World Series. Um, so we're excited about it. Uh, more details of the Division Three World Series will be coming out as we finalize them. Um, if you have any recommendations for those venues, please uh, send them to Alex director of Division Three Operations. His email is right there, alex.kane at callclubsports.com. I am now going to turn it back over to Eric to introduce uh, a lot of um, the people that run our sponsor accounts here. I'm talking about Tracy Reardon, Alex Kane, Paul Williams, Felicia Battaglia, and also Eric as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Alex and uh, he'll get into the uh, sponsors and fundraisers.
Christian is, uh, he mentioned I'm going to be the first of many faces you're going to see up here. Uh, we're going to go over all of our sponsors, the fundraising, all the behind the scenes stuff that, uh, you know, all your member teams can take advantage of being members of the NCBA. So some of the sponsors, just to name a few, Rawlings, DeMarini, Louisville Slugger, Fundraiser, Motel 6, Avis, and The Game. Um, and each of these accounts are going to have specific people coming up here talking about the opportunities and uh, benefits you can get through them. First up is uh, Tracy Reardon. She's going to talk about Fundraiser. Um, as Eric said, I am the fundraising sponsor account manager for the NCBA. Uh, my email is listed there. Basically, I assist all of our member teams with their fundraising goals by promoting our sponsors as well as other ideas and ways that teams have previously been successful in raising money for their clubs. Um, if you ever have any questions or any suggestions that you want to give to other teams that have worked in the past, please, by all means, contact me. Um, fundraiser is the official fundraiser of the NCBA. Um, a big point that I want to get across to everyone is that the last season we had almost $57,000 raised through this fundraising platform uh, across all four of our leagues. Um, Salisbury gets a huge shout out because they raised eleven grand in like eight days. So shout out to you guys because that was awesome. Um, basically, Fundraiser is an online fundraising platform for your team's budgetary needs. You can start a campaign online completely free. Um, all you need is a verified PayPal account and email address. And basically what you do is create your page, share it out on social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, your team's website, and via email to reach more uh, potential donors. You can invite players to share the fundraiser on their personal accounts to make it a friendly competition within the team. Um, and if you have any questions about it or want any more documents or helpful information to start your campaign, uh, you can just contact me at my email that's listed on the slide. Um, and as we've said throughout the presentation, if you want to ask a question, we have people sitting, waiting for your questions to be put into the comments. Type your name, team affiliation, and type your question or comment into the section below the video. And next coming up is our travel sponsor, who will be Mr. Alex Payne. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, as she mentioned, I'm the travel sponsor account manager. Uh, my main duties as travel sponsor account manager uh, is to just promote the NCBA travel sponsors to our teams, uh, you know, through social media ma mainly, as well as you know, phone days, um, emails, things like that, uh, as well. With at, well, excuse me, part of my duties as travel sponsor account manager uh, is to just help you guys with your reservations of your hotel or uh, your cars, and just promote. Um, make sure you guys are getting the discounts that you're supposed to be getting, uh, whether it's through, you know, Avis or Motel 6. Uh, first up, hopefully you guys know by now that Motel 6 is the official lodging partner of the NCBA. Uh, you know, you guys can use this whether it's personal or, you know, team related. You're going on trips in the summer on vacation or you're going on trips during the season. You guys can use it at any time. Um, the sponsor offers 10% off the best available rate. Um, so it's, you know, really great. They offer great prices to begin with, and then you guys get 10% off of that as well. Uh, there's over 1,200 locations nationwide, so you guys are never too far away from staying in a Motel 6, so be sure to take advantage of that as best you can. Uh, the best part about Motel 6, they offer a lot of amenities uh, that include complimentary breakfast, uh, free Wi-Fi that a lot of other hotels might charge you extra for, so another great perk with staying with Motel 6. Uh, the booking with Motel 6, extremely easy. Uh, you guys can just follow the link that's here on the screen and it'll take you right to our Motel 6 corporate page and you use that just as you would with any other motel or excuse me hotel booking site uh, or you could go to the NCBA sponsorship page and find the Motel 6 link there. If you guys have any questions always feel free to contact me. My email's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, next up we have Avis. They are the preferred rental car agency of the NCBA. Uh, they have vehicle classes from compact cars to 12 passenger vans Obviously, 12 passenger vans are great for a lot of these trips. Uh, you know, you rent one or two of these, uh, possibly three. You get there all on time. Your whole team's there. You show up. You look a lot more official, uh, and it's just a great way to get there and be ready to go for the games. Uh, with Avis, they offer exclusive pricing that's not available to the general public, so right away you guys are saving more money. And they also waive the under-25 fee, which a lot of the time is just as expensive as the rental is, 
So you guys are going to be saving a lot of money. Again, you guys can feel free to use this uh, personally or NCBA related at any time. Uh, feel free to call them at their official reservation number listed on the screen or you can book online at avis.com. Just be sure to mention our account code, which is in bold here at the bottom, D712300. Another great perk with Avis uh, that we also like to promote is the Avis Preferred Program. It offers additional benefits on top of the benefits you get by being with the NCBA. Uh, another great perk is it's free to join, so there's really no reason not to. With this program, you guys sign up and you earn points in addition to the savings you get with being with the NCBA. And then those points can be redeemed at a later date for free rental days. So might as well, it's free and it's uh, easy to use. Uh, for more information on that, you guys can call me, email me. My email here is at the bottom of the screen, or go ahead and follow the link that is here on the screen as well. Uh, again, if you guys are just joining us, you'd like to ask a question, uh, go into the comments section of this video. You know, write your name, your team affiliation, and your question. We have a narrator ready to go at any time to let us know what your question is. Uh, next up, we'll talk a little bit about our equipment sponsors. Uh, first off, we have Rawlings, New Balance, The Game, DeMarini, and Louisville Slugger. We'll be introducing myself, uh, Paul Williams, Felicia Battaglia, and Eric Curator a little bit later, just going through uh, a little bit about what each of these um, organizations have to offer you guys. Uh, first up is New Balance. Uh, a lot of you might not have heard, but in the spring, we partnered with New Balance to bring you guys an exclusive opportunity to get uh, cleats, turfs, trainer shoes, at an unbelievable price. You know, New Balance is great. They have great quality shoes at an already affordable price, but now you guys are going to get them for 25% off of their already great price. Uh, they have a specific store designed just for the NCBA. Uh, currently, we're working with New Balance to get that site ready to go and back up before the fall season. So just stay tuned for more details. You know, always follow our Facebook and Twitter pages. Uh, we'll have more information about the store coming up here soon. Um, I'm also the account manager for that, so if you guys have any questions, always feel free to contact me, alex.kane at coldclubsports.com. Uh, next up, we'll bring up Paul Williams. He's going to talk to you guys a little bit about Rawlings and what they have to offer you. All right. I'm like Tracy, I need to pull the microphone down. Um, so like AK said, Alex, uh, my name is Paul Williams. I'm the Rawlings account manager. I'm new to the position. I started back in May. Did the did the rookie thing and brought notes up with me. Um, my job is to pretty much help you guys get all the apparel and equipment that you need. Um, from jerseys to shirts to gloves to helmets. Rawlings has it all. You know They can hook you up with all of it. Um, Feel free to call me, send me an email. Uh, I can send you catalogs and other resources to help get you started. Uh, from there, I'll be able to give you uh, quotes, send you invoices, and uh, once the order is completed, I'll be able to give you updates on that, like tracking information. All right, so first, Rawlings is the official baseball provider of the NCBA. All NCBA teams are required to use NCBA stamp balls for all NCBA sanctioned games. Um, at the beginning of the season, actually probably in the next couple weeks here, we'll be sending out surveys for you guys to fill out. And once you get those in, uh, you'll be receiving free baseballs. Uh, Rawlings also offers practice baseballs. You know, obviously you don't want to be using your game balls to practice with. You don't want to get them messed up. Uh, game balls cost 55 per dozen. Practice balls cost 35 per dozen. Anytime you need more, just let me know and I can help you out. Uh, next, Rawlings is the official uniform supplier of the NCBA. Right now we are in the 45% discount period. means all Rawlings jerseys you get 45% off on. That runs from July through November and then in the beginning of December drops down to 35%. 35% is obviously a great discount, 45% is even better. So get those jersey orders in. Uh, I'll show you some of the jerseys that we have to offer. All right, so first we have the stock jerseys. Stock jerseys are your basic colors, basic design. They come with the uh, team name, your front and back numbers, and the piping. Um, they're usually you know, the, the cheaper options, but they're still 
great apparel and look great out on the field. Next, we have the custom jerseys. Custom jerseys, uh, they're available in a larger selection of colors, a larger, a larger selection of designs. This is uh, not a great example, but it kind of shows you how, you know, compared to the stock jersey, you can get the red here on the sleeve. Uh, you can get a black and white jersey with that, you know, half black, half white. There's a lot more options than there are to the stock jerseys. Uh, as with the stock jerseys, you get the team name, the front number, the back number. Um, then I forgot to mention with the stock jerseys, they come in three fabric options, which I can go over with you uh, when you contact me. Same goes for the custom jerseys. You get three fabric options. Next up, we have Vapor Fusion jerseys. Uh, these jerseys are available in an even larger amount of colors and even larger amount of designs. If you want the, you know, the camo look or the pinstripe look, you're most likely going to be going with the Vapor Fusion jerseys. Um, the biggest difference between Vapor Fusion and custom and stock jerseys is how the decoration is put on. Decoration is your team names, uh, numbers, any logos you have on that. Um, on the Vapor Fusion jerseys, they're going to be built into the fabric as opposed to being sewn on like they are in the stock and custom jerseys. Um, all the jerseys come with the NCBA patch on them. Uh, if you guys are interested, uh, email me, call me. I'll send you an online catalog and uh, I'll also send you a link to the Rawlings My Locker page. On the My Locker page, you can pick out and design a jersey. Once you have a design you like, send it over to me and you know I can give you a quote from there and go over your options with you. Uh, next up, Rawlings is the official protective equipment and performance apparel supplier, the NCBA. Uh, your discount applies there too, 45% until the end of November, and then in December it drops down to 35%. Um, all D1 NCBA teams will receive either a full set of catcher's gear or any combination of eight helmets. Uh, your performance apparel items include your shirts and shorts, compression shirts and shorts, your sweatshirts, your polos, your jackets, and your pants. Uh, your protect protective equipment items include batting helmets, protective shirts and shorts, uh, sliding shorts, catcher's helmets, uh, leg guards, and chest protectors. Uh, these items are available in a variety of sizes and colors. Uh, with the apparel, Rawlings will not put your you know, team names or logo on there, but at 45% discount, you're going to get blank apparel. It's a great price and an even better uh, product. Take it to a local vendor and have them put your uh, team name or logo on it. It's, it's a great deal. Uh, here's some of the popular apparel items. My personal favorite is the three-quarter length uh, sleeve uh, hoodie. Rawlings just added like six new colors to them. They're awesome. Uh, some of the other apparel items that are available, again, if you're interested, uh, this isn't all that Rawlings has to offer, so reach out to me and I can send you the catalog. And then finally, Rawlings released a new bag line this year. Uh, it's awesome. It, they have a variety of bags uh, available in a variety of sizes and a variety of colors. Um, if I was on a team, I would absolutely want to walk into a game with matching bags. You know, get the team looking dapper. Uh, reach out to me, I can give you a quote. Uh, so that's all for me. We're going to bring up Felicia next. Um, again, any questions, call me, email me. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Hello. My name is Felicia Battaglia. I am the game sponsor account manager. You can contact me at felicia.battaglia at coldclubsports.com or you can call me here in the office at 412-321-8440, extension 107. I handle all of Cold Club Sports headwear. The NCBA, as it says in your rule book, is required to get your headwear through the game. Uh, you can contact me directly for all of that. I handle all of D1, D2, D3. Uh, you don't want to be caught in the field not having your sanctioned headwear from the NCBA. Um, my job is to promote all of the game's benefits to the teams. 
I manage the ordering, the billing, the invoicing, payments, and delivery of all the game sales activity. I assist in auditing the game sales activity to ensure optimal benefits are being received. So currently, we are having a sale. It began in July, and it will run through November 30th. You will get $2 off of every hat that you buy. Um, that is on the field hats and off the field hats as well. That is a great deal for teams, especially if you want home and away hats, because it'll cover all of them. Mm. Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> the game is the official baseball cap of the NCBA. All teams are required to wear the game caps with the NCBA logo on the back. Now, when you call me or email me to order your hats, I'm going to direct you to go to the game's site, which is thegameheadwear.com. You can totally customize your hats. You can design them exactly how you want, put your logos on them, play with the colors and everything. You can email that directly to me. When I get that, make sure that you include your school name so that I know. I know some schools have D1, D2 team. I need the info included as well. When you pay for your hats, the front logo and the back NCBA logo are included in the price, which is great. If you add an extra logo to the side, that's an extra dollar per hat. But for that one fee that you're paying, that includes the front and the back, and you can customize them as you want. If you order early, which is going on now, until November 30th, you get $2 off the hat. But I have to stress this. If you order after November 30th, you may not get your hats in time for the first game of the official season. It takes a while with the holidays and everything like that, so I stress that you please try to take advantage of this $2 off and get your orders in early. You want to plan for at least four to six weeks for production on all custom orders after the artwork and licensing are approved. So once you've paid, I'm going to place your order with the game. It takes a few days to get your official artwork back. Your artwork gets submitted from the game directly to your school. Once they approve it, and you've approved it through me, that that's the artwork that you want to go with and your hat's good to go, it'll go into the production phase. All custom hats are made overseas. They take four to six weeks to be produced, and then they'll ship out to you. If you buy stock, they're produced here in the U.S., but it's the same deal with artwork and licensing. Once the school's approved and you've approved and they're good to go, then it takes about 10 days for that production until they ship out to you. The game holds the majority of the school's licenses throughout the country, resulting in the ordering process being easier and faster. Offhand, I would say there's about six teams that we don't, that we aren't currently licensed for that I know of, so you should be good to go. The game can re recreate any artwork design used on any previous caps teams have ordered in the past, along with matching it on a similar cap model, which creates a, an easy transition. I know not all teams have ordered with us in the past, even though that is what you're supposed to be doing. So if you've gone through a different dealer, you can email me that artwork directly. I can get it to the game. We can get you put on a sanctioned hat, and we can get you guys legal. The game can supply you with off-the-field headwear for the team to wear or sell to friends and family, such as boonies, beanies, and straw hats. This is something that I'm not sure that all teams are aware of. So these are some examples of hats that you can get with. This is the camo which was used for Wood Wars last year. And then these are some other hats that you can customize. But you can play with the colors and everything. You can see how the NCBA logo goes on the back at the very bottom for any new teams. And that, again, is included in your price. But these are boonies. We have solid colors, and we also offer the multicolor. You can get your team logo put right on the front of the hat. These are also included in sales. And there are also beanies, which are the little knit hats. You can get them with the ball on top or without the ball. Those are included as well. Um, those are sold a little bit differently. You can get them. The more you get, the cheaper that they get for you. So I don't have any <laughs> for an example for this year. I know that Pitt, University of Pittsburgh, they ordered a boatload of them last year. So they do sell. You can go to thegameheadwear.com to view a full catalog online. You can use the cap builder to design your hats, email the design to me, I'll price it out for you, but remember to include your school name, whether you're D2, D2, or uh, D1, D2, or D3. 
Um, you can contact me with any questions, um, email me or call me here in the office. Okay, now I'm going to turn it on turn to Eric for Dean Marini and Louisville Slugger. Thank you, Felicia. Um, one of the last sponsors, I believe the last, we're going to be going over is Dean Marini and Louisville Slugger. Um, obviously, my name is Eric, as you guys have seen me talk before. Christian mentioned I'm the uh, interim account manager. You guys will be meeting Joe next week. Um, he's a lot taller than I am, and he'll have a lot more information about everything regarding everything with Louisville Slugger, Dean Marini. Um, he's going to have these uh, surveys coming out in the next couple of days with uh, the two bats that you guys get, the one uh, D Marini and the one Louisville Slugger with your membership. Um, also, he'll have information on additional bats you guys can get through him too. You guys get exclusive pricing. So, um, in the short term, feel free to email me, but I will pass you over to Joe once he's uh, up to pace next week. D Marini and Louisville Slugger, as I was saying, is the official bat of the NCBA. Uh, also, as I was saying before, I guess, uh, you get your free bats with the membership in your league one uh, D Marini and one Louisville Slugger. It's included in your dues and your membership, so we'll get that to you, the survey to you within the next couple of days, and we'll uh, take care of that process of getting you those bats. And uh, all you guys get exclusive pricing. Um, you know, the prices are so low, we can't even say it here. Um, it's, it'd be illegal if I told you the prices that we can offer you, so we have to tell you over the phone. So that's how good the pricing is, so contact us, contact Joe, we'll get you uh, that exclusive pricing on your additional bats. Everything from BB core, composite, wood, fungos, slow pitch, softball, um, you know, anything from gifts to, you know, holiday, anything. We, we have it covered for you. So contact us at the NCBA. We'll get you that exclusive pricing and the discounts for you to uh, take advantage of. And last but not least, we'll uh, introduce Rachel Weber, Sports Information Director. Hey guys, um, like Eric said, my name is Rachel Weber. I'm the Sports Information Director here at the NCBA. I'm also the Mid-Atlantic Regional Director. Um, some of my main responsibilities is social media, so um, I'm usually the one behind the phone for Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram. I also uh, direct and produce the Sweet 301 stuff, all of these league meetings, um, also write and distribute press releases and our monthly scouting report, which is our little monthly rundown of what's going on um, across Cold Club Sports. Um, biggest thing for you guys that you can do for me is follow our pages. The fact that you're here on Facebook is amazing because this is where a whole lot of our information comes from. Um, so get your teammates involved, have them ask to join the league, we'll add them. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, follow us on Instagram. Um, just again, a lot of our information comes out on social media because we know that's where you guys get a lot of your information. Um, lastly, if you guys ever have anything cool to share, um, one of your teammates is doing something cool across the country, let me know. We can promote it. If you have tournaments, let us know. Again, send me anything you got. Um, and that's all really I do. So um, I'm going to call, I guess, just Christian back in here. Um, to wrap up the meeting. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate uh, appreciate that. Um, we're done. We're done here. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. If you stuck with us through the entire presentation, kudos to you. Uh, I do apologize for the uh, little interruption we had in the video feed. Um, we will have this archived, so if you aren't able weren't able to watch the entire thing uh, only caught bits and pieces of it it will be archived for you uh, I believe on YouTube uh, as well as I'm assuming on Facebook as well um, our goal I also have a goal to break down each segment of the league meeting um, so have just separate uh, videos of um, or segments of the fundraising or separate segments of team operations so that you don't have to watch the entire video to get that important information so look out for that as well um, thank you thank you thank you for tuning in um, this was an informative meeting we hope that you got something out of it um, we, we really do we really appreciate you tuning in um, we talked about the league and Rachel talked about social media making sure that you're joining the social media sites Twitter 
uh, following us on uh, Facebook, joining the Facebook group. Um, we talked about all the sponsors that we have on board with us. Please utilize those sponsors. Um, they invest with our, our league, so we hope that uh, in turn you guys will invest with them. If there's any issues, that's what our job is to, to solve those issues. So if you have any questions, comments, or concern, please reach out to us. That is what we're here for. We love talking to you guys. We love working with you guys. So please utilize us as an asset. Let none of these questions go unanswered. If after this meeting something comes up that you may have forgotten to ask during the meeting, please reach out to us. Uh, go to our website. All of our contact information is listed there, emails, phone numbers, all of that. So any questions you have, don't leave it go unanswered. Make sure that you're reaching out to us, and we, uh, we're able to answer those questions for you. Um, we need to keep the lines of communication open. You know, having that registration form, which we talked about way earlier in the meeting, um, updated with the updated contact information is essential for us to keep those lines of communication open. So please make sure that we have the right people uh, that we're communicating with. Please be prompt meeting deadlines. We have a lot of things happening, scheduled request forms coming out. We have the equipment uh, order form coming out. A lot of things that we assign due dates for. The annual league dues have a due date. Please be sure to adhere those deadlines. We would really appreciate that and make things run so much more smoothly. And then the last but not least, it's kind of embarrassing doing it by myself, but it's a game. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs>